Hello and a very warm welcome to the Economic Times Future Next Singapore Conclave. Today's agenda is set around the theme of creative destruction through technology. The world witnessed a year full of uncertainties and economic tension as the pandemic impacted businesses and lives globally. The deteriorating economy resulted in decreased demand, desolate growth and unprecedented business challenges. Getting a grip on such uncertainty was not at all easy. Innovative strategies were statutory to lead way for a creative, elementary transformational shift in enterprise IT. The virtual program is aimed at providing a holistic insight on the overarching issues, opportunities and options available to IT leaders in their effort to gain a competitive edge in the post-COVID era. Eminent industry leaders will guide and share their experience on developing, implementing and capitalizing on digital innovation to achieve desired business outcomes. This event is the result of the collective efforts made by a group of partners. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge their participation, supporting partner ISACA, Event Tech Partner Vconfix, and this is an initiative by etcio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all show the active engagement on social media as well. So don't forget to tag us using the hashtag etcio_futurenext. Let everyone know all the updates of this conclave. Now, without further delay, let's begin this event. I would like to invite Yashwen Singh, Executive Editor, ETCIO Economic Times, for a welcome address. Platform is all yours, Yashwen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to welcome you all to the Economic Times Future Next Singapore Conclave organized by ETCIO. I will just take a little bit of time to talk about ETCIO first because I'm sure most of you won't be familiar with it. ETCIO is a comprehensive media vertical and vision to offer news, information, data, tools and services to IT decision makers across all industries. Our endeavor is to help them take smarter and faster decisions about IT in their respective organizations. ETCIO was started in 2013 and has since come to be regarded as a premier media platform for business and technology leaders. ETCIO fosters the commitment of its parent publication, Economic Times, India's largest business publication offering news, information, data, and insights across industries. Well, that was about ETCIO. Talking about this future next Singapore conclave, this is ETCIO's first initiative across Indian borders, which speaks volumes not only about ETCIO's growing reach and clout, but also of the exemplary leadership and innovation displayed by business and technology leaders in the entire Southeast Asian region, with Singapore being the hub. The theme for this inaugural edition of the Future Next Conclave is creative destruction through technology, which we believe resonates perfectly with the current times. It's been an uncertain dozen months that the world has been through. Everything that could go wrong did in fact go wrong. A sluggish economy, shrinking demand, bleak growth prospects, trimmed budgets, and remote working infrastructure have led to unprecedented business challenges. Digital initiatives went into overdrive, and in many ways, the future was pulled to the present faster than we had imagined. But despite all these challenges, the fact remains that you, the CIO, still managed to weather the storm. And how? There was a staggering shift in priorities, accelerating collaboration for a stay-at-home workforce, maximizing productivity, improving time to market, building a resilient enterprise, and realizing the latent business opportunities to deliver tangible business benefits. Juggling these priorities was by no means easy. It required you to unearth noble strategies that paved the way for transformational shifts in your IT roadmap. It required you to practice the enduring business principle of creative destruction, which is the act of demolishing long-standing practices, challenging established norms, and experimenting with the untried and untested. Creative destruction helped you make drastic moves, not only to see the pandemic through, but also to look at how you're going to tackle what lies beyond. ETCIO is delighted to invite you to the first edition of the Economic Times Future Next Conclave a premier forum for you to exchange ideas, insights, perspectives, and knowledge with your peers across industry segments. The program will examine overreaching issues, opportunities, 
and options available to the IT leaders and how they can get ahead in the post-COVID era. Eminent industry leaders will guide and share their experiences on developing, implementing, and capitalizing on digital innovation to achieve desired business outcomes. We are compelled by the need of the hour to come out of our niche and embrace technology. The event will give you a glimpse into the future now. We hope the agenda, curated specially by experts keeping what's on top of the mind of business and technology leaders, will excite you and the discussions over the course of the day will add a lot of value to your time. Thank you all once again for joining the Economic Times Future Next Conclave. Have a wonderful and knowledge-filled day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Yashwind, for setting the tone of the summit. Ladies and gentlemen, you can drop your session-related questions in the chat box. Our experts are here to answer your questions. Stay tuned for the next session. For business leaders, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated unprecedented change. The question most leaders are facing then is this. How do we move forward in such uniquely uncertain circumstances? Positive, effective leadership helps us navigate crisis, rebuild communities and forge ahead in moments of ambiguity. But with so many challenges colliding at once, many leaders may be struggling to chart a clear way forward. To discuss this in detail, we have a leadership dialogue leading in uncertain times with Dr. Ram Charan, Global Advisor to CEOs and Corporate Boards, in conversation with Sneha Jha. Over to you, Sneha. How do you find your footing when the ground beneath your feet is constantly shifting? This is a common predicament le business leaders are facing today. Indeed, these are uniquely uncertain times. There is no playbook or blueprint that the business leaders can follow to navigate through this crisis. And indeed, there is no experience that they can draw on to address the developments no one has ever seen before. It is quite hard to find an apt answer to the most relevant question in today's times. What is the next normal going to look like? To find answer to this and many more pertinent questions we have with us today, Dr. Ram Charan, who is a celebrated author and global advisor to CEOs and corporate brands. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Ram Charan. Now, you know what they say, real leaders are forged in crisis. What are some of the leadership lessons that the world will take forward from this pandemic? Thank you for having me on this uh, description of the future. The future is created by human beings. New future doesn't have to have a playbook of the past. We got to change our attitude. Human beings are creating a new future. It's new future for everybody. And each of us have to shape the future going forward. Those who shape it, those who take advantage of it, those who cope with it are going to be the winners. Those who are looking into the past and trying to get the past solutions, they will have a tough time. COVID, it came without notice. In future, many such events will take place without any warning. We all have to be future ready. There are three unmistakable lessons of COVID. 
People know it. They talk at the cocktail parties, but they don't adopt those lessons. Those who adopt those lessons are going to be winners. Those who don't adopt it, they're going to be laggards, and some will disappear. Lesson number one is speed. We used to develop drugs over a 10, 11 year period. Our leaders in pharmaceutical industry have unmistakably demonstrated you can develop a drug, sometimes known as vaccine, in less than a year. A little detail, within a week, when the genome of the virus was put on the website by the Chinese, the decision was made, the basic component of the vaccine, it was done in two days. They had the basic composition of the molecule in less than 45 days. They had the manufactured vaccine going out in less than a year. Pharmaceutical industry has learned the lesson. We don't have to wait for 10 years to create a new drug. This lesson is for every industry, every company, that speed is the determinant of your competitive advantage. Figure this out. If you can't, you suffer. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the, this phenomena has happened before, 2008, 2009. Now it is 2020, 12 years later. Frequency of these surprises is going to be more often. Even if I'm wrong, you've got to be prepared. To be prepared means you've got to be agile. It's a buzzword. Everybody uses it. To be agile, you have to be prepared. You will miss some, but you have to have an organization that can respond faster than anybody. If you have seven layers, you're going to have three. It's not a dream. It is here. And you're going to have resources and reserves to be able to adopt and take advantage. There were many people in COVID who had high debt, no cash. They got caught. They suffered. So the second item is the agility. Third item from COVID, that the habits of the people have to change. They cannot go to the offices. Economy is hurt very badly. So the third lesson in from COVID is if you are not digitally connected, you die. There were companies, they did not connect customers digitally. They procrastinated, they suffered. Those who were ahead and they satisfied the customers, they made a very good progress. For them, the future is bright. What we did not have to do before COVID is the real care for the employees. The message is clear. Employees matter. Safety matter. They need to be rewarded. They need to be cared for. Let there be no doubt that we need to go forward on this. It will be foolhardy to go back pre-COVID and neglect the employees. Not only your employees, but the employees of your partners, of your suppliers, of your ecosystem. These four lessons are in a stark, a clear daylight. And we need to pay strong attention to those lessons. Uh, with uncertainty at such a global scale, it makes it hard for the business leaders to find their footing. So what is it that they should do to move forward in these mm. uniquely uncertain times? And what are some of the blind mm. spots that they should mm. avoid? First thing we should admit, there has always been uncertainty. What is different about this uncertainty? And the business people always found not only cope, but shape that uncertainty. What is different here? One, there is more complexity. There are more qualitative factors, starting at the global level with political, social, economic, 
disruptions between country A and country B and country C is going to happen, it's going to go forward. This is history of human life where there will always be some people who have different views and they use different kinds of tools and weapons to win what they want to win. That's not going to change in human history. We are getting better at it. We do not have the old days of uh, the Hitler days where there was a lot of mass destruction. So that's going to happen. The second thing is that in the area of uncertainty, we know a number of things will help you. They have happened before. And one of them is keep an eye on the customer. Know the customer. People say, I know, they don't. You need to know how the consumer behavior is changing. You've got to have your feet on the ground. You've got to have a nose in perceiving the behavior change. Some people do better than others. That will guide you to be flexible, to be adaptive, to be responsive. Consumer behavior in fundamental sense does not change every minute. It has resilience to it. Now to do this, you and I need to learn what causes those changes in behavior. Those behavior changes don't happen out of the sky. Today, almost 10 years ago, Amazon made recommendations to the consumer gave data to the consumer to compare. In some respects, Amazon is the catalyst to drive consumer behavior change. Today, we have a $50 cell phone, a smartphone. A consumer can compare things very fast, gets the information. That is creating a change in the consumer behavior. Are you, as a company, observing that behavior. You can predict that behavior. If you are a B2B, you say, I don't deal with the consumer. My recommendation is you change your attitude. You got to know the consumer behavior and influence your direct customer. It's happening now. You got to do this. So that's item number one. Item number two, as I mentioned earlier, the innovation cycle in the drug industry has been shrunk by a factor of 10. What's yours? More relevant innovation, more frequent is the answer to the uncertainty. Because if you have a more frequent, more relevant, faster, you get to test it. Some will fail. No innovation, no future. So today in Amazon, they release more than 300 innovations a minute. Try that. They shape it. You say it takes a lot of money, benchmark it. You hear it, you got to go and see it. It doesn't. Because those who use digitization, the incremental cost of innovation is very, very low. That's how they're able to do 300 a minute. Now it's a very large company. So you got to create the pace and the speed of relevant innovation for the customer. You will win. So uncertainty is a function for some who don't do such things, it's huge. For those who do some such things, they learn faster how to predict and how to take advantage of it. They know how to take the risks better than those who don't. And that's why these people succeed better.
So it's very interesting how you uh, wove all of these pieces together, how you put them together, that uncertainty is the new certainty. And then it helps, uh, innovation helps you be more responsive to the market and be more customer centric, listening to the voice of the customer, observing customers' behavior helps you, you know, push innovation within your, uh, you know, pipeline of experimentation with organization. And that's, these are the strategies that can then help you combat uncertainty with more confidence and aplomb. That's interesting. Uh, now, when we're talking about uncertainty, uncertainty now you know these are turbulent times we know that and in turbulent times businesses cannot assume that tomorrow will be an extension of today so what what is it that they should do to move forward what are some of the trends in digital transformation that will help shape the business environment of tomorrow we have a company in japan 24 7 continuous stream of voice of the customer and we use digital machine learning algorithms to identify the patterns. And they get factored in the product development. They shape the world because we go where the cause of uncertainty is. Now those who project yesterday for tomorrow, they're dead wrong. They won't survive. They got to look at the future and their assumptions and work backwards. We're looking at the consumer behavior. We're looking at what's growing, what's causing it. We're working backwards from there and say, okay, how do we have to adapt? So those who are using last year's data, 2019 data, they're going to be disappointed. Those who are looking at 2021, 2022, 2023 data, working backwards and saying, where do we take the risks? They are going to be the winners. And they're, because they have innovative services, innovative products, and consumer likes it, that's how shaping the environment. Today, we are able to serve each customer according to the customer need. We deliver it to the customer in one day, in one hour, at the time the customer wants. We're shaping the future. We're creating the expectations of what they are. And it's not we. It's a large number of entrepreneurs compared to even five years ago. Today, any human being who has a cell phone, a smart cell phone, and possibly a $50 computer can start a business. And they know if you got a good idea, the funding will chase you. You don't have to change funds. So the shaping of the environment is happening. Some may not be shaping it, but others are. Learn about it. Today, the data of anything is available instantaneously, but definitely in less than 24 hours. Learn how to find that. It's there. It's coming in. Search it. Distill it, focus on it, act on it. I've always said this. If you are a CEO of a large company, you are a business person who knows the customer first, CEO second. If you're not the first one, you won't last very long as CEO. And that's where you go for uncertainty. How do business leaders select the right people and assign them the right functional mm. areas and right positions? Mm. This is a question from thousands of years, centuries and decades, and it always remain. What makes a leader, leader of a non-profit organization like Red Cross, business organization like companies, prime minister, a president. A leader's first job, other than vision and communications, is to have the right people in the right jobs. And we talk about it, we don't teach, and yet some do a very good job. A large number of people who do a good job often have no formal education. It's unbelievable. It's true. There is no secret formula for it. 
And there is a lot of intuition, a lot of sensing. But we know a couple of things most people can use. And these couple of things come from the arena of sports, uh, be it cricket, be it football, be it tennis. Somehow, the great talent emerges. IPL, right? right? Okay. This one day stuff. Well, are we seeing new talent coming through that did not come out before? It's there. And they had no chance to get through to the system. Let's open it up. So there are two things that most people will agree. And my point is not they have to agree. You have to practice it. And both have to be done simultaneously. And in my 50 years of work where I select CEOs, the selecting people miss both of them. I mean, I've seen it in my own eyes. First of the two, and they both have to be done to know precisely what are the two or three things needed in this job to be successful. They miss it. That very high level thinking, general thinking, but not nailing down that if these two or three things were not done well, person won't succeed. It has to be very specific, very deep, very clear. The second item is, and it's so easy to do, is to see what is it at which this person excels. This person can't wait to get out of bed. Hunger driven. This person even dedicates things to get that. Where do we see this? In music. Hmm. People need to learn. There were six lyrics writers in Indian Bollywood in the golden movie period. How each of them struggled. Bad. Sahi Ladyanvi, Badiwi, Hasrat. They slept on the floor. A Devanan had to move, figure it out. Sunil Dutt was taken to the bosses of the studios. He got tested. He, he didn't even stop, just walked out. I will never make it. Meena Kumari. You should see the sad story of this lady, Madhuwala. But there was talent. They came out. Why not in business? We, we, we worship people who made it. But go back to their early days. It's Steve Jobs, 12 years. Bhadakta Hindustan mein. No food. Before he built the company. Go to Harinama places, ashram. Go and get the food from there. He had a talent. His first job. His bosses put him on a 2 a.m. shift. You kill the bosses, what the hell is going on? So what? what is this person? We do that in our Indian culture. I go to my sister's house, for example. I see her kid, 12-year-old kid, 10 year. I watch her, I say to my sister, you know, she's gifted in singing. Give her a tutor. We should do the observing of the people. I do that in my life. I picked up people who were nobody's recognized and took them all the way to be CEO of very large companies. But the talent you can recognize. Why can't we do that in cricket? We do in cricket, we do in football, we do in tennis. Why not in business? So those are the two elements. Practice that. And this does not require a degree. People use consulting firms to do that. They do tests. I'm not against it, but nothing substitutes to those two questions. How can organizations leverage digital transformation to prepare for a future that's more collaborative as well as more competitive? Inside a company, it must be collaborative. Inside a company, if you're creating competitive, it becomes toxic. If you make the data transparent, you will reduce toxicity. Data enables you to do that today. We didn't have it before. But 
both collaborative and competitive with the partners, eco partners. Right. Now, there are zillion examples of this. Amazon is built on that. 58% of their revenues come from ecosystem. And they compete every minute with each other. Amazon against a partner. They have this price, this price, they change. So it's going on for years. It's nothing new. And people have to learn to do that. So I'm competing against you, competing against you. But to compete against those two, I need both of you and vice versa. It's going to happen. The pandemic era has catapulted IT in a position of power. So what are some of the expectations that the newfound expectations rather that CEOs have from CIOs and CDOs? Yeah. So here, as I see around the world, in many, many industries and companies, the CEO and the executive suite, in some cases, is now inviting the chief digital officers in the shaping of their strategy. What does that mean? Most of the CEOs and executive people are not trained that how machine learning and AI can open up new markets with existing core competencies and major markets. So they're now inviting in the strategy discussion from say, if we did this, 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 you open up a big area of your market to go in. But this, what I just mentioned, is done by very few people. It will happen in the future. Right now, it is happening with the consultants. Consultants going in and they show that. Mm -hmm. They are trusted by the CEO, so therefore they're opening it up. But that's what they need to do. Now, when the CDO goes to the executive committee meeting for strategy, they got to put a clip on their mouth and say nothing about the names of the algorithms. They got to talk about customer, they got to talk about need, and they be able to say that if we use a technique without naming it, we can double the market size of this demand. I guarantee you, the CEO will knock your door and say, we will held, not held any executive committee meeting without you. You are showing the door they did not see. Mm. That if you do this, this, it will double the market size. Adobe, Shantanu Narayanan came to the conclusion 10 years ago, that I sell these packages for multi-million dollars. If I use this technology, I can create a package for each individual. His market value has gone to be higher than IBM. That's what a CDO needs to do. And you talk in the language of a street vendor. You don't talk these undefinable words, double the size, yeah, here you do, they need it. But you have to conceive before you go or in the meeting, what does it do to the size or profitability or cash or customer satisfaction or market share? Dr. Ramcharan, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you, sir, for sharing your expert advice with our audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to visit the help desk in the lobby for any query related to the platform. Our representatives are there to guide you through. Stay tuned and keep tweeting using the hashtag ETCIOFutureNext.
The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the businesses and lives globally. The world witnessed a year full of uncertainties and economic tension. Getting a grip on such uncertainty was not at all easy. Innovative strategies were statutory to lead a way for a creative, elementary transformational shift in enterprise IT. In this panel discussion, experts will discuss the topic CIO takes center stage in the post-COVID era. I would like to invite Yashwen Singh, Executive Editor, ETCIO Economic Times, to moderate this panel discussion. Over to you, Yashwen. Good morning, viewers. Thanks a lot for joining us in this interesting session on CIO takes center stage in the post-COVID era. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a crucial digital turning point for many organizations across the world. It is expected that the demand for digital solutions will see a rapid rise and IT functions will play an instrumental role in creating that roadmap. And when we say that IT is going to play a crucial role, it will be who else but the CIO who will be in the driver's seat. Let's hear it from some of the top technology leaders on how and why do they feel the CIO will take center stage in an enterprise in the post-COVID-19 world. Please allow me to welcome our panelists of the day in alphabetical order. Ms. Juliana Chua, Head of Digital Transformation, SLR Group. Mr. Parminder Singh, Chief Commercial and Digital Officer, Media Corp. Mr. Rene W. Keller, CIO Corporate, Commercial and Institutional Banking, Standard Chartered Bank and Mr. Saiful Bakhtiar Osman, Head of IT APAC for Ascent Fund. Welcome panelists. This is the first panel of the day and we'll set the tone for the rest of the sessions that follow. So I'm sure this one would be really exciting and I'm looking forward to an amazing exchange of ideas. For our participants, we'll also take questions from all of you after the session. So I will request all of you to please type in your questions in the chat box and I will read them out if time permits for the panelists to answer. Let me set the ball rolling with the Juliana. Uh, Juliana, why and how does a CIO take center stage in the post-COVID-19 era? You know, we've always uh, said that CIO doesn't get his due, but uh, the pan pandemic has taught everybody a lot of lessons on technology and digital transformation. Do you see that uh, perception now changing and CIO taking the center stage now? Definitely. And I think it's a very good question. I think COVID uh, really shows us how digital is very important into really connecting the world when it's not possible to be connected. So during the entire COVID, I think CIOs of the world will probably uncover a lot of gaps during this entire pandemic. Uh, it was really like a big pressure test as to what are the infrastructures that you have been building? Could they actually withstand uh, this entire uh, big change that's happening. So during this entire COVID, we look at what was really lacking or what really requires enhancing and what requires changing. I think that's how the CIO really take the center stage. And really what we're looking at is to how do we then strategize and prioritize, right? Because there is so many things that was undergoing this whole pressure test. The customer experience might be lacking, the infrastructure of how you're going to respond. And at one point when no digital solution was undergoing uh, so much calls back and forth, that was uh, going to the cloud, suddenly there's a big overwhelming position that we all have to take. So what do we strategize and what do we prioritize to be something that is required to fix? Even if you look at the brands of the world, Amazon, Walmart, they have also have to do the same thing, to prioritize what is more important to be fixed and what is the really the key crucial ones that we want to serve to our customers as well. And we actually have to lead with that goal in mind. Once you have the goal in mind, you then determine how to take the center stage and what are the things that could be delayed for a, uh, that could uh, take place at a later time as well. So I think for a CIO to take the center stage, really to lead with the strategy in mind and also execute with the ground level stuff to see what is really pertinent at the customer level. Sure. Great inputs there, Juliana. So the CIO needs to keep a goal in mind and pursue that relentlessly. Great. Uh, let me come to Rene. It's a fact that technology-driven solutions are no longer nice to have for companies, you know, that were forced to operate virtually. Uh, they are essential to survival. Uh, that's a fact now. And these companies are looking to the CIO to help them understand and implement sophisticated digital tools on a greatly accelerated timeline. All these, uh, you know, seems to imply that the CIO is now firmly in the saddle. So does the CIO finally take the center stage? Uh, your thoughts here, why and how? 
Uh, please unmute yourself, Rene. Yes, sorry. Um, yes, I mean, I've been in uh, technology for financial services for, for many years, as you can see, and I have been waiting all my life for this moment. Um, the question was, why now? And I think uh, Juliana and yourself have already asked answered it, it's been COVID that has been that strong enabler and strong accelerator to really go digital. And I really think that all of the CIOs around the globe in every business, in every aspect, they deserve with their teams a lot of credit because, you know, they kept the businesses afloat uh, during that really unprecedented uh, pre -presented time. Now, if I look at what has happened is internally, we need to keep the company going, enable com uh, collaboration and communication and, and in a work from home setup. Uh, externally, you know, we had to boost the digitalization also because, you know, again, working for, for a company, for a bank um, in different markets in Asia and Africa, lots of clients, they were still paper-based and they wanted to go into branches and they were actually quite reluctant up to the pandemic to take on digital offerings. But that has totally changed, as you can imagine, for those clients as well. It's been survival critical. Now, how will a CIO in financial services take center stage? I think there are three aspects. First of all, we have to take a very active part in the business strategy and innovation. Technology will drive business agenda, as you just pointed out. Technology innovation, they will allow new business models. So we have to become integral part of that business strategy and innovation. Second, it's driving the digitization agenda. And internal, that means automation, it means enabling real time. Uh, and external, it means allowing a seamless client experience. And the third part, you know, I now see I'm getting pulled into client conversations all of a sudden, sudden because our clients also digitize their business. And for that, they need technical solution. In our case, it, it will be APIs uh, to power their digital journey. And one big learning, I think, for all of us being in the tech space is communication. We have to learn to speak non-jargon. We have to understand the business language, our clients, and we have to be able to, to translate all this technical stuff into a relevant conversation for our colleagues. Sure. Great, uh, René. Uh, so uh, there is this, uh, you know, uh, blessing in disguise for CIOs, like you said. Great. Uh, Parminder, uh, it's a radical shift from, you know, just a few years ago when the rise of consumer technology had many business leaders predicting that the CIO position would soon be obsolete. On the contrary, the CIO now has a critical role to play as the driver of digital transformation. Your thoughts, sir? So uh, you're right. And I think the, the trajectory of a CIO's role in any organization is following the trajectory of how technology is becoming fundamental to any business. You know, gone are those days when technology was just an enabler. Initially, it used to be considered by a lot of businesses, which are not so-called digital native, that te all technology does is makes things faster, better, more efficient. That continues to be true. But beyond that, technology now is actually core to a business. That's number one. Number two, it's a differentiator between one business and another. another. And this is not just true for technology businesses. But any business, all businesses are tech businesses now. Take the example of, let's say, a fast food chain. In a fast food chain, there's only so much innovation you can do in terms of your food, right? And most of the differentiation is coming in terms of how do you set up digital kiosks for people to give their orders? How do you understand your customers' innovation in terms of delivery and so on? So technology is core and center of it. Take the example of uh, a sports good manufacturer. Let's say you're manufacturing shoes. They are going beyond just giving shoes. They're moving into lifestyle using apps and understanding their customers and so on. So tech is becoming central to any business and also becoming the key differentiator. And who's the best person to enable this? It is the CIO. And, and I would say the, you know, the I in CIO, which usually stands for information, does not do justice to the role of CIO. And I, uh, so the, the way I look at it and I, what, what I suggest CIOs is think of the I as not just information, but also as interpreter. You are supposed to take the technology trends happening all around, whether it's AI, big data, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and understand how to take those trends and implement and use them in your business. And the second 
version of I is implement. So interpret and implement. Uh, make sure you understand the technology and inter-implement it in your core business operations. So a CIO is not just the chief information officer. He's the chief interpreter officer and he's the chief implementation officer as well. Sure. You could also be the chief innovation officer, right? Absolutely. I could also stand for innovation. Absolutely. Great, Parminder. Uh, let me come to Seful now. Seful, in a recent survey from uh, market intelligence firm IDC, I was just going through it. CEO said that they expect 48% of their revenues <coughs> to be derived from digital products, services, and experiences by 2025. Today, the business leaders who were predicting the death of the CIO in 2015 are talking about return on innovation as the new ROI. It kind of justifies the CIO role uh, going ahead. Your perspective. Okay. Uh, I agree with what uh, we said by all the panelists, Juliana, Rene, and also Pamela. So in terms of uh, the importance of technology has become more and more certain uh, currently with the pandemic and all, like, uh, the business uh, process, the traditional way of doing things, everything has already uh, gone, it's already obsolete. So there's a, we need a new way uh, to leverage technology on how to survive. So technology has become a lifeline for the business to survive. Like for the uh, traditional business, uh, as uh, pointed by Paminda just now on, if you take example, the sports, sports shoes or the sports apparel, so before this, having uh, uh, many outlets helps in terms of uh, reaching your customer. But in the time of pandemic, people cannot go out. So your products cannot reach your customer. So what is the option that we are left? So this is important that uh, by using technology, now they can access all your products where maybe by online shopping. So this is how you reach the reach reachability, how you reach to your customer. Then uh, for survival, business needs to be highly, highly adaptive and also dynamic. So as uh, for uh, digitalization is something that the in thing uh, that all the management is talking about now. So as a CIO, our role is to make sure that uh, how do we play our part in this. So we need to show, make sure how to accelerate the business by leveraging all the technology, how to address the gaps and also uh, to find the right fit for the solution. Because uh, not only that we want to, we need to spend in terms of uh, making the business to uh, to catch up with the loss during pandemic, but in doing so, we need to also to be concerned in terms of spending. We need the right solution, not to overspend. The right solution will make sure that uh, the company will survive, the company will catch up, but at the same time, uh, they will not be uh, overdoing things. That's my uh, idea. Sure, sure. Great thought there, uh, Seful. Let me come back to Juliana uh, again. Juliana, in the post-pandemic world, CIOs will have to play an important leading role in setting business strategy and enabling business outcomes rather than just outputs created by business to deliver value. How can they play such a pivotal and central role in an organization? I think for CIO to play this important role as a bridge to really uh, setting the business strategy and also enabling this outcome uh, is really to understand uh, uh, the different uh, business ambition. So in a manner where we I sit at the HQ level, we have uh, we oversee more than 30 markets. So at the 30 markets, this strategy that is coming from every different market could be really uh, fixated on what is happening on the ground in their market. So what is the business uh, ambition of the country manager? And at the HQ level, we have to understand what is the business use case and focus on this entire customer journey to achieve the results that is uh, desirable by the country manager. So at the HQ level, how do we develop such tools and also uh, digital products to really realize the digital ambition that the country manager needs to drive their business uh, in the country? So there are three angles that we work on. It's really the viability, the feasibility, and also the desirability by the end uh, customer. So on the viability side of things, we look at things whether they are sustainable. Something that we build, could we actually... Uh, go through the pressure test, will they be able to sustain for the next one to two years? In the space of a digital world, 
I think viability uh, at every project that we do, right? It could be a six figure, seven figure amount. So we need to understand the viability as the business ambition. The feasibility side of things, whether technically can it be built, right? There is a lot of legacy, especially when you work with uh, conglomerates and you work with uh, a company that has huge infrastructures behind and tons. We have over close to 200,000 uh, B2B customer and the B2B customer are serving millions of people, right? So what is the feasibility for the architecture that we stand? The last point that we really look at is the desirability. Whatever that we are building, is this only the internal view or could we actually reach out to our B2B customer to understand uh, what do they really need on the ground? Uh, is what we are building trying to fulfill our own desire, but more importantly, it should be fulfilling the customer desirability as well so that whatever that is being pushed up, the adoption by the end customer will be very high. So I think that's what we want to use the budget for and how do we really play this important role in stringing together the viability, feasibility and desirability together. Sure, Juliana, that's a very comprehensive strategy, a very comprehensive approach that you've uh, adopted. Uh, uh, Rene, one way I believe for a CIO uh, to add value to business would be to look at a solution that could help in accelerating performance by responding rapidly to the changing business needs and dynamically scaling their infrastructure. You know, this is one of the ways that they can directly impact business outcomes. Uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, so um, let me take a little step back in, in how we are going to play a role now in the business strategy context and driving outcomes. I think there is also a little bit of a danger because we're now moving from order taker. The, the CIO has been a cost block and we outsourcing and we have we tell you, we business tell you what you need to do. And all of a sudden we are on center stage and uh, we think we are going to drive the business. I would say not so fast. I think we are best uh, advised if we uh, if we get into a trusted advisor role. That means we are going to co-define, we're going to co-own, we're going to co-create, we're going to co-implement, and we're going to co-celebrate uh, as well. So that we become an integral part of the overall business even more. And I think of that in two ways. First of all, in the strategy and innovation, but second also, and that's what Parminder said about implementation and transformation. Again, we are driving a huge book of work with 6,000 people in IT just in, in my area. So you have to think, you have to, you, you have to put that force to, uh, to, the, to the right topics. So we have to get a deep understanding in IT about what the business uh, really does, about the industry. We have to become a competent partner. And then we have to make IT strategy part of the business strategy. I look at it no longer as it is separate, but it's fully integrated. And that will allow us then to advise our our business colleagues and actually come back with innovation, uh, innovative ideas and how this can be implemented. And the second part is equally important. That's the transformation and the implementation that we need to drive. We call it new ways of working, where we jointly work with the business in an agile setup, driving you know a, a joint objective scorecard. Um, and I think that is very, very important. In short, we have to get a table, a seat at the table with strategy set we're driving the business every day, but also with client meetings. I think that's something that is really new. So I need to wear a tie or, or not. Um, and then also keep in mind, some of our business colleagues, they're technically not very versed. So they can also be easily embarrassed. So I advise my IT colleagues, become a trusted personal advisor too. explain them what an NFT is and how cloud really works and all of that. Uh, they have to talk the language of business, Rene, right? That's right. Great, great. Uh, Parinder, uh, has the CIO's place as a cross-functional business leader crystallized during COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, why and how? Because, you know, uh, we always talk about how CIOs can touch various strategic business units within the organization. And that's really critical for the entire company to move forward on the growth trajectory. Do you think this has now actually been crystallized uh, through the pandemic? Yeah, I, 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 I believe so. And I think it's not just been crystallized, but it's been consolidated. Some of it is out of sheer necessity. The fact that people could not go to their uh, offices, the fact that the customers could not come to your shops, 
forced companies to create systems, to implement technology, to make sure that those bridges, uh, the contacts uh, stay intact. I'll give you a very interesting example of a client that I was speaking to. This is based here in Singapore. It's a fairly large wellness-based company, and they cater to the supply supplements, traditional Chinese supplements to a slightly more senior age group. Uh, they never felt the need to seriously consider e-commerce because, you know, seniors, seniors would like to come to their shops, would like to talk to their uh, shops, you know, uh, people at the shop. Uh, they were almost like, uh, you know, uh, almost like a semi-doctors for them. And they would want the touch and feel before they buy a product. Everything was fine, but all of a sudden, uh, they had to close down the shops. Now, here's a company which has like multiple showrooms, but does not have a viable e-commerce strategy. And overnight, their technology team had to switch swung, swing into action and convert their regular retail salespeople into e-commerce specialists. And this had to be done overnight because, you know, business goes on. So I think some of it has been just forced out of the sheer necessity and the conditions that COVID has brought upon us. But I hope that this has also served as a bit of a lesson that we need to be prepared and we need and the CIO needs to be this crystal ball glaze, gazer who can predict some future scenarios and hopefully keep the company ready and armed for something like this to happen. You know, they, it's a, you know, they say that never waste a crisis, right? It's a bit of a cliche, but like a lot of cliches, it's true. You should not waste a crisis. And, uh, and, and some people, there's a lot of argument in the tech industry. Was this a black swan event or not? A black swan event means it was totally unpredicted, right? Uh, some people say, no, that was not a black swan event because Bill Gates predicted this. He was talking about this all the time. But the fact is businesses got caught off guard, right? That's the truth. So, so the fact is now we should, hopefully we've learned a lesson and we know that not only do we have to make sure that we have our systems ready for something like this, but the CIO is at the center stage of predicting future events, future scenarios like this, and making sure the organization is nimble, ready for any such future scenarios. So absolutely, their role has got crystallized and consolidated both. Sure. Great. Saiful, do you, do you echo uh, Parminder's uh, statements uh, here? Uh, you know, because with business IT collaboration key to digital transformation, a lot of these forward-looking IT leaders are breaking down silos to develop blended startup-like teams focused on key business initiatives. You know, while all this may not be as easy as it sounds, but this is the time when CIOs can actually try and do this because, you know, there is least resistance to change uh, during this time period. That's what I feel. Uh, your thoughts here, Saiful? Okay, I agree with what uh, being said by Parminder. So basically, uh, uh, as you said uh, earlier, is uh, there is a blessing in disguise. So currently, uh, what is expected by uh, to uh, any CIO is that a CIO is to have the ability to uh, function in the cross uh, functional leadership. So this uh, a CIO nowadays is uh, expected to be a marketing expert. So how to advise the marketing, how to come up with the uh, new ways of uh, marketing your products to make sure that uh, the uh, the reach, outreach to all the customer, potential customers. Then uh, the CIO also is expected to be a process subject matter expert because in coming out with a system, in coming out with new processes, uh, we cannot just simply for digitization, just take whatever we have, then we transfer it into digital. That is wrong. So uh, whatever we need is that we need to review all the process to remove uh, unnecessary steps to uh, review back any redundant process. So then again, after we digitalize, then only we have an efficient system, a productive stuff, and easy to use uh, by all the by all the staff, and also uh, is friendly to our customers. Then uh, SIO is also expected to be a business strategist. How do we position ourselves? Uh, what is the ROI if we invest in this kind of uh, system? What is the what is the uh, what is the cost for investment? What is the expected ROI? And the ROI must be something that is realistic. We cannot uh, promise the the moon and the sun to the management because we will surely fail, and I will not be in anybody's shoes if that, that happens. So that's why we have to be realistic. Then uh, CL also must be someone that. A finance consultant. So in this time of uh, pandemics, uh, we need to advise, uh, be an advisory to the company in terms of spending. 
in terms of our own budget, in IT budget, wherever we can uh, save, wherever we can, like contracts, we can uh, redeem back. We can review whatever that we can uh, save in terms of uh, cash. Whatever the excess cash is a bonus to the company. So like, for example, in terms of uh, coming up with a product, like uh, currently I'm working in the financial services industry. So the important thing is, this, uh, is that uh, how fast can you onboard a client? So this is very important. Uh, now we are in process of recovering. So to get the customer, how fast can you onboard a client, a potential client, a potential investors? So in terms of KYC, is it manual? Can we change it into eKYC? So to make it more efficient, what are the steps that we need to review back, the steps we, we, we need to remove so that later when we implement, it's faster onboarding of customer and also uh, convenient to our investors and also our clients. That's the most important. Sure, sure. So business agility is of paramount importance, right? As businesses bounce back to growth. Great, Seful. Uh, Juliana, uh, moving forward, uh, cutting down on IT capital expenditure has taken on significant importance during the pandemic. Every business, uh, even businesses that are not taking a considerable hit from the crisis are also being extra cautious and pulling back uh, in spending. Uh, money. In such a scenario, how should technology leaders accelerate digital transformation to increase customer value? It's a tough line to walk, but what's the way ahead? So I think for one, there is the firefighting. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of where we see the pandemic or where how COVID has hit us, it has really exposed different gaps in the business and how do we really respond with our agility, right? So there is the firefighting in things that we are trying to fix. But I think more importantly is also the what we are actually future proving our infrastructures, right? So we talk, uh, Paminda talk about shared uh, necessity, Rene, you talk about co-create, and I, we do advocate for all those things as well. So how do we really work in a composite team so as not to do in a silo and think about products uh, as in digital products and not the systems. When you talk about systems, it gets uh, very heavy for anybody to understand because it gets so complex, but we don't understand the customer angle. What is the customer benefits? So when we talk about products, we get to appreciate it from a different level. And really on savings, I think it's a little bit more on what do you cleverly spend on, right? What are the quick wins? How can we do as a minimum viable products? And what do we do really as a proof of concept, right? Because I come like, uh, when we talk about business uh, requirements, we look at they wanted to build a Ferrari that's probably going to last you for the next 10 years, but we do not know how the adoption is going to be. So whether do you buy the Toyota first before you buy the Ferrari so that you can crash and burn with the Toyota before you really achieve to buy the Ferrari for, your, for the generations to ride on, right? So how do we externalize also with strategic partnerships in mind? Certain spendings are probably not required. The reason why I say it's a strategic partnership, it could be a subscription model that we are working on. And how do we really co-create this together such that we don't have to really put in a seven-figure or eight-figure digit into building an infrastructure? We externalize with ex uh, strategic partnerships in mind, go serverless, and also look at a software as a service uh, model to really enable this entire test and learn. So this uh, capital expenditure could be really mitigated with a different view in mind and therefore also be able to catch up on the new agility of how it should work, right? Imagine if you are going to put in a seven digit or eight digit kind of budget, the time that you will need to actually get the entire approval process going, uh, I think the pandemic would have been over if you get the process going. So why not really try this different approach to building something that is lighter and is faster to move ahead for the future generation as well? Sure. Great, uh, Juliana. Rene, do you agree with the Juliana here? Uh, you know, because it's time to walk the talk. CIOs have been asked to do more with less since long. But today they have to actually practically do it. What do you think? Yeah, so I, 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 like Juliana said, look, we, we are managing multiple priorities. We're managing costs. We're managing innovation, uh, functionality that produces revenues, client experience, compliance in a, in a, in a bank. This is very important. And we also manage, you know, a, a historically grown park of technology obsolescence. So it is actually a, a highly complex, multidimensional puzzle that we have to solve as CIOs. And you've got 
got to be careful that you're not ending up on the wrong side as being the guy that is always too slow and it's too too costly and all of this. And I think no matter whether you're at the moment in in a in a position to invest or to invest, I, I think you know we are putting more money behind getting through that tunnel right now of getting from old platforms to new, because for us is really critical, be, wanting to become the digital corporate bank in the future. But irrespective of that, I think the success factor is to have one joint strategy, one drive, one outcome jointly. And uh, the new ways of working, as we call them, uh, to, to uh, uh, Juliana's point, it is a client journey that you have to have in mind end to end. And not only from a client experience or revenue perspective, but also cost technology. And it means that our business colleagues have to understand that in some parts, we might to have uh, to repair some of the tech. We have to take some out and renew. We might have to invest. And if you work jointly as a team and you have got one scorecard that you work against, and I'm really amazed I'm only with Standard Chartered for a bit more than a year, but we have come a long, long way. It means I don't have all these escalation uh, meetings that I used to have in the past because we're having these discussions jointly at the table to to constructively uh, resolve these uh, priorities. And so there is no no finger pointing anymore, no escalations. And again, um, I think at the end, with the available money you've got, you have to very specifically and very decentrally drive the best outcome. That's another thing that I think, Juliana, you mentioned that no matter how much money you've got, it's time to market it is speed. And and you, if you have got long decision making processes, that's not going going to cut it anymore. You have to decentralize the decision making, move fast, and move in short cycles so you can course correct and reprioritize as you go. Great, Rene. Great inputs there, uh, Parminder. A CIO's response needs to be a multi-horizon based approach addressing the short long term challenges. I mean, from three months to nine months to 12 months. Right? That, that's the approach I feel that CIOs need to adopt uh, as they move forward. What should be the strategy for the short, mid and long term uh, that CIO should look at? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that's a great point because, you know, on the one hand, the CIOs are expected to keep the lights on, right? You just have to keep the business running, day-to-day challenges, uh, everything from things breaking down to the speeds not being good, all of those things, that's really, really short term. In the midterm, there is increased dependence on the CIOs to really uh, ensure that uh, the business is working, moving forward, and you have a clear differentiator. And then the third part, the long term is, there's so much happening in the world of technology. Uh, there's so many new terms, right? If you if you don't, imagine you don't switch on your uh, computer for two weeks and you come back, you'll find that there's been a, uh, a completely new set of words that you are not even aware of, right? That were non-existent two weeks back. And that's the reality we live in. And the CIO is then expected to understand all those terms, all those technologies, and see what's the long-term applicability of those new technologies in the in the business. Now, it's it's it, 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 it's a tough line to walk, of course, but they have to do it. W- one advice and one thing that I yeah, I think it's important here: there's no one foolproof strategy. Each business is different. But one thing that's pretty much applicable to all businesses is that CIOs or the top management should know that innovation or technology introduction in the business is doesn't always have to be top down it actually has to spread across the organization that's the only way to manage this piece that's the only way to make sure all your short mid and long term priorities are taken care of but how do you do that it's easier said than done like what's the practical aspect of it now practically how do you make sure that you are you always have your pulse on what's going on through dialogues. You have to create dialogues and the CIO's responsibility is to make sure that they are platform for dialogues. And I think there are three types of dialogues a CIO needs to facilitate. Uh, and and we, f- we follow this at MediaCorp. At the first level is everyone in the technology team, uh, whether it's a digital team or technology, whatever you call it, should have an oversight as to what's happening in the technology world. So we, we create, we have a forum called Tech Jams where everyone comes and openly shares what he or she is working on. Because, hey, you know, no single person understands all the technology, what's going on. And you never know somebody else from a different project team could add input to your project. So it's really, really important that within the tech team, there is no information asymmetry. That's number one. 
Number two is tech to business. You have to make sure that the technology people are able to share with the business what's happening in the world of technology in a very intuitive manner, in a very de-jargonized manner. So make sure you make technology very intuitive, very de-jargonized for the business to know what's happening because that creates a dialogue and dialogue sparks innovation always. And the third is outside the stakeholders outside of your company, tech companies, uh, global companies, invite them to your offices, go to your offices, share with them what you're doing, because a lot of these dialogues then again spark innovation. Some of these partnerships are counterintuitive, but they are very, very important. So I think a CIO can have his finger on the pulse and make sure that short, mid, long-term priorities are taken care of. If he becomes a dialogue facilitator between the tech teams, between tech to business, and with the external stakeholders as well. Sure. Wonderful inputs there, uh, Parminder. Uh, panelists, we are fast running out of time. So uh, one final question to all of you before we open up the session for questions from our uh, participants. I'll start with uh, Seful. Uh, Seful, uh, going forward, the need of the R for enterprise IT leaders would be to deliver flexible and agile capabilities like everybody has just said, uh, to create new products, services, and experiences to end users and customers. How are you ensuring this for your business? What are your plans with respect to all these uh, in the coming months? Okay, uh, as for us uh, in uh, SF services, the most important thing is that we have to uh, train the staff and also empower the staff to make sure that uh, all the staff is uh, one, they, they are uh, engaged with the management. So we foster the innovation uh, within the staff so that the ideas, as uh, Perminda uh, mentioned just now, from bottom to up. So it's not no longer it's a one-way uh, session from top down. So it can be from both ways. So this will encourage and also uh, foster innovation. Then uh, what's also important is that to select the right solution in terms of its uh, supports, agile development, flexible coding, and also open uh, and easy to configure logic flow. So, but uh, also important is that to have, uh, to implement a security by design because it's important for us to stop firefighting because if we implement uh, security by design, then we do the first time right. Then it saves a lot of uh, hassle in the future. Okay, great. Rene, quickly, your thoughts here. Yeah, so I think for us, it's important to be very clear now about what are our core competencies. So we want to move our infrastructure into the cloud um, because there are better placed companies to actually manage infrastructure. We want to be very clear where we buy versus build. Um, integration is very core for us because you, you have got lots of innovation out there. As also Parminda said, we need to be able to harvest that, integrate it. And the last part is data. I think that's where technology across the entire company and industry, you know, is able to, to bring that data together, create insights and, you know, come up with very innovative new business model ideas and, um, and, and predictive analytics and machine learning models. Sure. I would say very important is take the business along through this process. And secondly, I think that's also what Parminder also mentioned, where I feel very strong, a strategic ability is to be uh, adaptive to the future, uh, responsive quickly, because we never know what comes around the next corner, the next minute, the next hour, the next week. Sure, sure, Rene. Juliana, what's on top of your priority list? Cloud, uh, machine learning, analytics, data, that's for Rene. What about you? I think the top three that we have is really the culture. So how do we develop this digital culture so that we embrace the differences and have uh, empathy for the different uh, challenges that uh, different business users will have? The second one is agility. So on the customer experience, how do we do this continuous improvements and continuous uh, development? Because nothing is perfect uh, when you, bu you build it, right? Uh, six months down the road, business would have changed. Uh, consumers would have changed. Uh, their experience needs to be updated. Uh, even the apps on your phone gets a, a money refresh as well. So how's the agility that we do continuous uh, improvement and continuous development? Uh, the last one that on, is on uh, the strategy side of things is really on the scalability side of things. So like what Saifu has also mentioned, right? Scalability is something that we look 
that. How do we build something uh, first with a minimum viable product in mind? And how do we scale it uh, up, making sure that the infrastructure is built correctly and it could be scaled to an enterprise level uh, later on as well? Great, Juliana. Parminder, final comments from you. Yeah, I think all the participants have given some great inputs. I'll just add a, a, a quick framework, share a quick framework that we've used, which worked for us to uh, look at technology and innovation. We call it ACE, A-C-E. A stands for algorithms. Understand how algorithms are, are impacting your business and be on top of that. That's number one. C stands for communities. Make sure you understand how communities, crowdsourcing, the gig economy is working for you. That's number two. Number three is engagement, A-C-E. Uh, new forms of engagement, whether it's AR, whether it's VR, anything new that's happening. As long as you have some kind of a framework through which you may look at your business, look at technology and mesh the two, uh, you'll be in good shape. Sure. Great, uh, great inputs by every uh, everybody there. Uh, but unfortunately, we have run out of time, but we'll still take one question. Uh, the question is uh, from Mr. Shijo Joseph. He wants to know, how did you all manage educating the board on the need for going digital? I think that's a very pertinent and relevant question. Anybody who wants to take this up before we quickly uh, bring the session to an end? How did you manage to convince your board on the need for going digital during these tough times? Well, don't confuse them with technology. Make sure you un interpret technology into business outcomes because that's what boards are most uh, concerned about. What's the business outcome? How does this lead to betterment of the business? So be the interpreter of technology into business and, and, and I'm sure the board will listen to you. The board will have digital on their mind. I don't think there is any board member these days who's not thinking about digital. So Perminder is 100% right. Come with relevant examples that, can, that the board can relate to and make it actionable for them. Sure. Great uh, panelists. That's all we have time for. To sum up today's discussion, CIOs have been called on to help their organizations to survive in the short term and position for growth in the long term. As technology leaders, CIOs are firmly in the driver's seat and are all set to prepare for renewed growth in the future. The spotlight is completely on the CIO as the right technology choices made now will propel his organization towards the growth trajectory. With this, we come to the end of this session. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, attendees, for staying with us. There are more interesting sessions lined up for you, so keep watching Economic Times, which is complete. Thank you so much.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk at the Economic Times CIA Conclave. Uh, my name is Sharat Mohanty. I'm the Global Head of Trade and Supply Chain Finance uh, Client Implementation at Standard Chartered Bank. I have a decade of working experience in the corporate industry, dealing in the as a, as a CIO, regional IT head capacity, and for the last one decade, working in the banking industry on, on various senior role uh, related to digital integration, customer solutioning, application engineering, etc. Uh, the topic that I would be uh, discussing with you today is banking as a service or as it is known as called BAAS. So let me talk about um, what exactly this BAS means. And what are the key features of BAS, was banking as a service? Banking as a service is the equivalent of a software as a service as popularly known as SAAS. So I don't need to really go into the detail, which I assume most of you know what exactly is a software as a service. So BAS is the equivalent of the SAAS, which is basically delivering services, banking services, to the customers under the uh, under the equivalent of the SaaS model. The banking as a service is a plug and play digital banking service. One of the fundamental difference on the BAS, it's, it is always a customer driven instead of a bank driven. Typically when bank services are delivered to a, to a customer, to a client, it's always a bank who initiates that discussion and then eventually deploy the, the solution that works for the customer. In case of a BAS service, it is like customer on demand request for a particular banking service and the bank fulfills that service. So the fundamental difference in the BAAS is it is a customer driven approach as compared to a bank driven approach. Like SAS model, BAS is a pay per use service model. What does that mean? That when you wanted to, when you want to take a service from a bank, for example, today you will get an entire host of services and you pay a particular fee for the entire services. But if you really want to use one part of that services that you have been given today, that's not really available in, in, in the current offering model from the bank side. So in this BAS model, you could think of taking a smaller service, which particularly is of need to you at that point of time, compared to all of the services that a bank provides you. And then you just pay for that particular services, a smaller amount as compared to the full service model. And this BAS, like any other SAS service, is largely API and microservice driven. Yeah, so these are some of the key features of a BAS service. Now, if you have to imagine, you know, what does this whole BAS look like? To, to simply put, the BAS is, is like a pyramid. Imagine a pyramid. Yeah? On the pyramid, you have three layers. On the top layer, you have your customers or your brand or anybody who is transacting. Yeah? Then comes in the middle layer of the pyramid, which is where all the banking services are provided. Now, typically, as you know, banking services in the in the past or even largely today are provided by the banks. But in the context of BAS service model, the banking services not necessarily have to be provided by a by license or a regulatory bank in a country. The banking services can be provided by a fintech, any platforms. They, they could provide the banking services. However, to make sure that the banking services do comply to their country's regulatory model of uh, any, any regulators in a bank. So there is a banking license involved. So therefore, on the bottom of the pyramid, you, what you have is an actual bank or a financial institution who are licensed in a particular country to provide the banking license. So now to recap the pyramid, on the top end of the pyramid, you have a customer who is requesting for a particular banking service. On the middle layer, 
you have a banking service provider who, who is not necessarily is a bank but given it's a banking service which are regulated by the country regulators eventually the service has to come from a licensed banking service so that's a pyramid of a bas in a simple term to understand now what exactly happens in the pyramid there is a api based uh, demand comes from the customer for example customer need to look at their balance of the prior day or maybe during uh, lunch time so they would request for a, a balance update and bank will fulfill that particular request by sending back an api response saying that this is your balance as at uh, 12 noon on that particular day so this is a simple illustration of what a ba service look like from a technology a platform point of view now in summary if you if you if you look at bas is a best of both worlds is a convenience of a financial services through an on demand digital platform coming from a regulated banking financial institution so let's look at a simple illustration of a bas um service now as i mentioned there are three component or the three critical elements of any ba service starts with the customer and where does the customer customer typically goes to an e-commerce platform yeah the starting point of a ba service it could be the e-commerce platform like any other e-commerce platform you know the services that are provided to the um, to buyer and to the seller it could be the buyer who would be going there to buy the product and services the seller who is going to be selling the product and services in the e-commerce platform so you can imagine this could be a b2b it could be a b2c it could be a c2c as well yeah a good example you can think of you know like a grab portal yeah who, the company which is started with as a you know uh, the hailing car services but if you look at the types of services they offer in their platform which is just beyond just a normal rent rent a car or uh, or a hailing services then let's move on so this is the entry point or this is where the customer and the buyer and the supplier go into now the second step or the second critical element of a ba service is the fintech or the platform now this fintech or the platform providers they provide banking services and what are those banking services it could be mortgages services it could be insurance services it could be purchase order financing services it could be invoice financing services it can be a lending services it could be a leasing services it can be a cash payment services it could be a cash collection services it could be treasury management services it could be foreign exchange services so these are services that a fintech or a platform can provide you know and this platform or fintech are now integrated in the ecosystem of the bas and which is basically feeding into the e-commerce platform now most of the services that we just i just spoke about are all related to either a bank or a financing institution services now when a fintech or a digital platform can provide the service but they are not the license authorized or a bank or a financial institution in a country who could offer that service to a end customer so therefore once the services layers are provided by the fintech or the platform it will then go into the domain of the banking the license regulated banking or financial institution services who would then satisfy that service you know for example they could do the anti money laundering checks they could do the fraud detection check if the services meets all the criteria for the customer that is coming through the e-commerce platform they would do the funding they would disburse the loan if it is a it's a, it's a lending a transaction if it's a cash payment transaction they would disburse that payment to the end beneficiary so therefore if you look at this whole ecosystem of bas it starts with the e-commerce platform where all the services are offered to the end customer or a consumer yeah and then the services 
of the banking services at not necessarily has to come from a regulatory regulated or licensed bank it would come from a fintech or a platform provider would necessarily providing the services but in turn once a customer buys or subscribe to that particular services through the fintech platform who is literally providing the services have to go to the at the end to the bank and to make sure they satisfy all the regulatory requirement and the final leg of the transactions are fulfilled so they all are interconnected either to, uh, mostly on a real time basis through an api or micro services i think that sort of summarizes what could a transaction flow would look like in a bas in a ecosystem i just run through with an example let's say you know you are getting into the uh, into the in, in any e-commerce portal for example grab then you would want to say for example you wanted to buy a particular product or you want to buy some food and services from a, uh, a from a chain you decide to make the payment Uh, and those services could be coming out from a fintech or a digital platform where different fnb services are provided for example and now once you are ready to make the payment or buy a particular uh, food or beverage from that platform and then eventually the transaction goes through the banking world and then making sure that whole payment transaction are completed so as you can see uh, this is a simple illustration of a portal like grab where this whole finance transaction can be completed i think you can there are a lot of platforms are available in the world today or on the on the on the build phase to to come very soon who would be providing lot of core banking insurance services as a banking as a service so let me now um bring a, bring a perspective of how does this blockchain and banking as a service can coexist and uh, uh, this is one of my favorite use cases that i always use to to talk about blockchain in the context of a banking as a service so this is a typical rfp service most of you are very familiar when you want to do a request for proposal for a particular service that you want to buy and you know in, in in depending on a organization that you are in you know there are about 15 to 20 different department have to come together before this 120 pages of the rfp document is ready before it can be sent to the service provider think of a scenario if we wanted to launch the rfp service in the in the context of a blockchain in the bas for example uh, if i have to break it down for a simply uh, illustration point of view and a, a company who is buying a technology services obviously they are targeting to go uh, reach out to the it companies so typically the the company the bug company which is buying preparing the rfp document would list down what are my product services uh, sort of a required then comes the commercials yeah what are the commercials then what are the key milestone delivery timeline that uh, that is needed in order for to get the service then comes the service level once a product is sold what are the service level that the it company can provide then comes the legal and compliance to making sure that the service that um a particular company is buying fulfills all the requirement and then comes the technology solution the security aspect of it the architecture standard so imagine this is a scope of a typical rfp now imagine if you want to go to a blockchain you know if you're going to a blockchain for a commercials i don't really need to i can i can think of a pricing api for example which can be independently send it to the provider to submit what exactly the pricing commercials they wanted to quote for example look at the legal and compliance it you can think of a smart contract where the buyer and the service provider uh, can get into a smart contract to agree what are the legal and compliance terms and condition similarly if you are thinking about the key milestone your delivery timeline it can become also a smart contract you don't really need to exchange a project plan or a, or or a very detailed document to define what are your key milestones it can go to a smart contract similarly if you are looking at to provide your technology solution architecture what are your solution library what are the digital component of your architecture data model we can probably deal that through a digital library api and that can be shared with the uh, the requester of the rfp so imagine these are the services which 
which can be deployed quite easily in the context of a blockchain in the BAS. This is just a simple example I have explained, and there are plenty of use cases available today, either in the banking space, in the financial institution space, where both banking as a service can coexist into the blockchain world. And this is more of a futuristic view of how banking as a service can scale up to the blockchain service. Um, to summarize, uh, the BAS is still evolving. I think, um, I think if, if you look at the, the estimate today in the global marketplace is around 29 trillion US dollar opportunity on the e-commerce that go, that will go through in the e-commerce platform. But obviously e-commerce platform is not completely geared with all the domain, all the services that require to fulfill a diverse industry or a customer's requirement. Hence, the need for a fintech or a platform who would come back in a different industry, different segment can provide their services. But eventually, as we know, this is a business, this is a services that are highly regulated uh, through the banking license. Eventually, it has to be fulfilled by the banking license banker or financial institution chain to fulfill the request that a customer first initiates in the in the e-commerce platform. So that's in a nutshell is what is all about BAS. And this is a very interesting space. A lot of a lot of new concepts are coming in as the digital transformations are being you know, embraced and acknowledged by many large banks, financial institution and the corporate. I think the BS has got a very, very um, exciting time ahead. And, and I think in, in three to five years time, I think in my personal view, a lot more banking services would open up as a as a bite sized services for a lot of corporate or small medium enterprise client just to buy that particular service instead of taking the holistic banking services and where the usage is at that point of time for that particular function. So um, with that, uh, I end my um, discussion on the BS. Happy to take any questions. Okay, there are no questions. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Arvind, for a precise presentation on creative destruction. Automation allows organizations to do more with less, optimizing support for business units that have themselves become automated. For CIOs looking to spearhead their organization's digital transformation, automation delivers efficiency. To discuss this in broader perspective, we have invited a panel of experts to discuss on driving efficiency and agility with automation. I would like to invite Sneha Jaha, editor, ETCIO to moderate this panel discussion. Over to you, Sneha. Good morning, gentlemen, and welcome to the ETCIO Future Next Conclave. The topic for today's discussion is driving efficiency and agility through automation. Now, before I delve into the topic, let me set a bit of a context today. IT leaders wish they could wield a magic wand and transform their enterprise by enhancing efficiency, infusing agility, boosting productivity, and cutting costs. Wishful thinking, you would say? Not quite. Today, automation has emerged as a practical solution that can deliver on this long-cherished wish list. In these uncertain times, when enterprises are struggling to protect their bottom line, while also scrambling to grow their top line, they need tools and techniques that can help them achieve more business results with less or the same number of resources. 
automation does that marvelously it helps cost conscious and value seeking enterprises crack the do more with less code with automation your processes can be more agile adaptive intelligent and more responsive in a business environment in flux so this is the topic uh, we will have our discussion with the three gentlemen today and we'll talk about how they see automation adoption what is the state of adoption within the enterprise how they've adopted automation within the enterprise and reap the business benefits and what is the way forward we will talk about the futuristic outlook on how they see the automation adoption shaping up in the post pandemic era to make this session more interactive we would like to take audience questions audience please send in your questions in the chat box with that i would like to start off with angus angus can you tell me uh, you know this whole idea of automating your business processes has taken on a greater sense of urgency during the pandemic what should enterprises do before they get started on the automation journey hi uh very honored to be here so i think the automation we are talking about is like the next generation of automation so it's not like the the previous we were talking about like putting everything uh from paper to paperless right so i think um so the automation now today we are talking about is actually a bit of supported by the the cutting edge technology like ai and then coming back to the question uh the biggest change i think so the biggest change i think after pandemic is probably that um that many things are now online so yeah, you buy food online you order goods online you even do your yoga class online right so all the providers they also want to go online to meet all the buyers online and that actually pushed the automation to happen faster than ever before lots of data is now digitalized because those business is now online so this enabled a great deal of opportunity for automation when the data is digital the data can be used by machines then you can automate things like marketing like recommendation even product design so before your automation journey i think organizations have to draft a very careful strategy but not to complete the strategy so i'm just saying that is to draft the strategy on how to go from the data the information in the data to automation to enable more things So the first thing you need to do is you need to identify the use for information in the data. Then you need to think about how to utilize the information to create more value to the customers. And then secondly, um you want to identify the form of the value you create from the data and how do you deliver the value from automation to your to to the markets so that you are clients your customers can benefit from those and then this uh form of the value will actually greatly influence your their infrastructure to enable automation because now you have to think about how to collect data and what kind of resource you need to do all the automation like like the real time computation and do you need that like, big data or do you need uh, like a like very strong zero delay uh recommendation system so on the other hand so these are the things that we are we are we, are, we want to achieve through the new type of automation however on the other hand you want to think about in your draft strategy about what you cannot do so to be more specific um we all we all, we all know that the, the privacy has been a very top hot topic recently and there are privacy policies like uh uh and compliance like CCPA in California and the GDPR so before you start any automation so make sure you have to understand the compliance and the policies and before you collect store and use the data for automation so think about how to protect the data so this is to protect your customers and your business So to summarize my uh, answer to this question so for the automation strategy the key is that you won't be able to find all the answers in a short time but privacy and security is always the first step and then if you really want to create values through automations it might become a learning journey for the organization thank you, thank you.
So Angus spoke about uh, laying the foundational layer and the basic building blocks uh, before you, uh, you know, you, before you plunge headlong into an automation initiative. Now, speaking specifically of the bots, now once uh, an organization deploys, uh, you know, bots, they they also need to be constantly monitored and maintained throughout their entire life cycle. Uh, they need to be reviewed periodically. They need to be tweaked and retired from time to time. So, how difficult is it? to um, you know deploy and maintain bots my question is addressed to this one uh, thank you very much um, when we look at the bots uh, perhaps i would go back to uh, what angus mentioned about the automation um, so automation uh, it depends uh, when we talk about driving efficiency so it really depends on the industry and it also depends on your position in the supply chain the closer you are to the consumer the more relevant automation becomes and the results are more obvious if you are in service industry definitely there's got uh, automation there is also more relevant but when you are moving up if you are in b2b or if you are in b2g then automation uh, may or may not work uh, again it really depends and as angus rightly pointed out uh, that we have different privacy rules gdpr and others Uh, so when we look at bots, uh, so we need to see that what they are for, whether they are for compliance or they are for operational uh, aspect or what they are covering. Um, three things that I always mention that we need to look at people, processes, and technology. Unfortunately, we put technology before anything else. It's just like Descartes. When Descartes say that uh, putting the horse uh, uh, before the cart, so right, so. So we we can't put the technology in front of everything. We need to look at that. Who are the people? And here the people refer to IT people, operational people, and all, all those people who are involved in the operations of organization. Uh, then we look at the processes. Uh, so internal processes change all the time, and compliance or uh, legal requirements change all the time as well. So therefore, the bot you made today may not be workable or may not be efficient in the in the coming few months or coming few years uh, one thing the another aspect is that how how you design the bot uh, so a very well designed bot may be uh, may not be very efficient because uh, uh, the people are not using it properly again uh, then when we talk about that people so here people means that from the coding point of view the bot is working perfectly uh, but the way it is explained to the it guys was not uh, really good enough Uh, for example, a finance uh, uh, any any RPA in finance may render useless. So, therefore, you have to look at the bots uh, from time to time. You have to review them. You make sure uh, that the they, uh, the compliance are there. Uh, that is pro- perhaps the biggest issue that we need to look at. Uh, then the second aspect is that whether they fit in your processes and they are relevant uh, today. Uh, today means whenever you are working on them. and then the the last one uh, but not not the least that from security point of view uh, you may have bought but then that will open up the gates for uh, cyber criminals so we have to also look at this whether these bots fit into all these models very well so what do you say uh, so abhishek while we spoke about how to get started on the um, you know automation journey and how to keep uh, you know going back to the drawing board and checking if if you're doing things right keep checking if uh, you know the bots are really able to address the uh, issues that you had envisioned uh, for them to address uh, now if if an organization has to scale up its automation initiative beyond the initial phase of adoption what should organizations do to scale up their automation initiative so i think both uh, rizwan and angus kind of alluded to this but uh, i think it matters whether automation is kind of your primary value proposition because that very realistically affects whether deployment of automated solutions uh is right for your company at this point in time if your processes and workflows are kind of in constant flux uh, uh where the automation is not going to keep covering it you might not see the ROI before uh your solution is fully uh deployed so i think for us uh we try to tackle the parts of our business which were somewhat mature so we started building templates around uh, integration and interoperability that allowed us to quickly work with other partners and vendors uh internally for our technology side we started building ci cd pipelines that did everything from uh building our products uh deploying them 
linting and automated testing, which allowed us to uh, also ensure that we have better quality when it comes to the deployment of our products. And the last one, I'm, I would say this is uh, possibly a bit more visible in terms of the, the value proposition is building the data pipelines for analytics. So kind of figuring out where your anomalous data points are and uh, understanding key metrics for everything from, from performance to, to how your applications are working. I think these are the places where companies can look at automation as they provide constant value to the business and really allow the business to, to assess, to assess uh, and recalibrate quickly. The last one I think that we've started looking at is kind of automation at the inter intersection of infrastructure and development. So to really start thinking of how to build common tooling, common component tree across the various initiatives, products, and streams that we have. From a development standpoint, I think this, this resonates with a mantra that any good engineer is going to be familiar with, which is don't repeat yourself. Except here, I think the idea is to take it a little bit further to really build the infrastructure level tooling in such a way that any service you deploy automatically adopts any of the tooling and standards without without any required. It's usually not all encompassing, but I think if you understand your use cases well enough and set some boundaries on development and what you pursue, it mm -hmm. significantly improves both efficiency as well as the quality of your development. So I'd say that's kind of where we've been focused in terms okay. of automation. So now I'd like to delve deeper into your uh, your organization's use cases of uh, yeah, uh, of uh, automation, and how you're deploying it within your enterprise. Uh, I'd like to ask Angus. Angus, you represent AVP, AB, uh, AVYD Technology, uh, which has developed an AI-enabled COVID-19 response platform for the government of Brunei within a month. Uh, and this enables the uh, real-time tracking and monitoring of infection trends and predictions. So how, how did you bake automation into your business processes and workflows to deliver innovation at speed and scale? What did you do to achieve quick and sustainable success from your automation initiatives? Yeah, so uh, I think Abhishek mentioned uh, a few very important things that's also very important to us in the process of automation, everything, like the CICD, the tooling, and how to deploy, right? So... Um, so I think the key uh, to like, uh, so we're talking about the, the system we build in Brunei. So the key here is actually not about um, the logics or implementation behind the system because the technology can be seen actually in, in many places. It's, it's not rocket rock science. However, to make everything right in one shot, that's our biggest challenge. So I think you mentioned the one month. Yes, yeah, that's actually the biggest challenge. Is how do we react so fast? To why I said, you know, uh, automating at a scale and speed. We want to address that bit. The scale and speed. How does automation help you deal with that? Yeah. So so yeah, I think you, this is a very good question. So business process and workflows are indeed the key role. So so. Uh, in our success in Brunei. So I think um, we've been doing data processing and the healthcare system development for quite some time. So we invest actually a lot in security and the privacy technology. So uh, the, they, these are built in the automation of our system system development and the deployment process. The, the automation process actually comes with all the considerations that we can do in terms of privacy and the security. So we design the process and the tools to ensure that the security flaws can be automatically discovered and reported. We also design the way to uh, efficiently identify, like the, for example, sensitive data and try to desensitize them so we can later re uh, utilize them in a more relaxed way. And so with all these things, actually, this is actually to bring the confidence to our developers to trust the, our software development workflows so they can just focus on building the system at full speed. And then at the same time, we also make this, our effort like, transparent to our customers so they can put their trust in us very quickly. So that's one thing. That another big investment is actually the automatic data processing. So we are actually supported by a team that it's very strong in uh, medical data processing. So we automate, auto, automate almost everything in the process. And this is actually the key to achieve quick and sustainable success. Mm -hmm. So to quickly understand, uh, for example, in Brunei, what happened and where, so that the pandemic can be better contained. 
the data has to be standardized and structured very efficiently after they are collected from different sources. So, so to achieve the efficiency and the accuracy, we, I think I want to mention one thing here is that we, uh, we combine the domain knowledge. We have experts in big data processing, AI, and also healthcare into, so into our automated data processing. So this is actually to make sure the quality, hence the accuracy of our analytics and the prediction. Uh, now, Abhishek, uh, Angus spoke about, uh, you know, uh, accuracy and uh, analysis and how it helps with prediction. So my question to you is that, uh, you know, medical diagnostics is at the heart of efficient healthcare delivery. Uh, but it has its own set of challenges. Diagnostic companies have to find efficient, cost-effective, and innovative ways to handle the volumes without compromising on quality. So how does automation help you deal with the challenges of volume, testing efficiency, the need for speed, scale and the quality of the data. Sure. Um, I think for diagnostics, it's also kind of important to understand that they're very, uh, it's a very broad definition today in terms of how medical diagnostics or digital diagnostics are used uh, in the healthcare and medical space. There are, difference to, there are differences to, to how you can use something like software as a medical device compared to a diagnostic tool you can use in a research context. This uh, very really aff uh, affects the, the regulations and the controls you have to put in place uh, around them. It also affects the analytics that you're kind of looking at uh, in different scenarios. So I think one of the scenarios that helped us on the, the commercial uh, as well as the was in terms of anomaly detection. So kind of developing solutions to automate the flagging of possible erroneous uh, inputs or results. So I think this significantly reduced time spent on investigation and manual intervention. The most common implementation I think previously has been uh, very simple things like uh, deduplication or threshold validation. So I think these have been around for a, a very long time. But today what's interesting is these solutions are becoming more refined and more complex, combining data science, machine learning, and population statistics to highlight these anomalous cases and allowing these cases to be caught and resolved much faster. This really improves the efficiency there. The next one I would say is because we work in multiple markets, uh, it's important to understand that there are different workflows associated with all of these markets. To understand that there are different uh, healthcare provider requirements, clinical systems requirements, billing requirements, insurance requirements. So we've had to really understand all of that on a deep level before we pursued any automation of any kind. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at, and at the same time, these have to be done with the controls in place to kind of uh, keep in line with local regulation. What we have done here is kind of we've worked very closely with partners um, along the way and vendors to understand their workflows and figure out how to build automation around their requirements. So it's been working with healthcare providers and clinical networks to kind of build bespoke event-driven automations uh, to improve efficiency. One key thing here, I think, is to really identify broad and well-adopted standards. So in healthcare, this means adopting standards such as HL7 and FHIR which really allow you to work with multiple vendors at the same time, because the majority of partners and clients that you pursue are going to be working with these systems. I think what's also helped is that a lot of infrastructure companies like Google, Amazon, Azure have been investing heavily in making some of these standards broadly available and easy to deploy, and that's helped us a lot. But at the end of the day, all of this has to be done against the backdrop of regulation and oversight. The biggest place I think we focus on in terms of automation is really in building controls, analytics, logging, and audit policies. These have to be combined with manual processes for the time being, uh, thanks to regulatory oversight, but they're critical for, I think, any automated solution. And even though they're very time consuming, I think investing that time and effort is both important uh, and uh, has returns in the long run. Uh, you know, Rizwan, uh, Panoven is an industrial process uh, manufacturing company with emphasis on R&D. You provide solutions to the medical, electrotechnical, and the packaging industry. Now, how are you leveraging uh, automation to deal with the supply chain complexities and the rise in operational cost? What were some of the key drivers for, ad for the adoption of automation within your enterprise? And how have you seen the business impact of automation efforts that benefited your organization during the pandemic? Sure. Uh, so there basically I divide into two, two parts. One is the automation within the company and one is the automation of the supply chain. So our supply chain is quite long because uh, we uh, provide solution uh, in different 
uh, for different industry, for example, medical. Uh, but our base material is paper or uh, film. So when we talk about paper, it's coming from uh, uh, trees. And when we look at the, the supply chain, so uh, if we are buying material from Europe, where the paper they produce the paper, so generally for forest, it takes roughly between five to ten years to grow the tree and uh, change it into paper. So it takes quite long time. So uh, we, we can't control uh, uh, automation process throughout the supply chain, uh, but we could do that uh, to some extent with the, our logistic partners and uh, internal processes. Uh, for uh, for forest industry, there are IoT uh, that uh, based solutions that are being installed and. Uh, perhaps in the next three to four years, these things will be more operational. Um, so, so that we that is beyond our control. So, what is uh, under our control is uh, we are looking at that how we are doing uh, compliance. Uh, being in Vietnam, uh, the things here the le- legislation changes very fast uh, because it's a very fast developing country. Uh, so, in order to uh, continue with the uh, the whole world and requirement of WTO, so. Uh, from compliance point of view, in terms of automation, we have to uh, modify that very often, uh, our processes. Uh, so that, that is uh, one thing. Uh, from operational point of view, uh, we are working with fully automated plants, and they, these are uh, providing almost real-time uh, results to us. Uh, so we can actually see what is going on in terms of uh, quality, in terms of uh, um, cost in terms of uh, uh, efficiency. So there we can leverage on the automation very well. Uh, uh, but if you look at the supply chain, so uh, Maersk, for example, uh, uh, they invested heavily in blockchain and uh, other AI-based uh, solutions. So that, that is something that we can see the uh, silver lining out uh, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, definitely it would come, but uh, it's not uh, that we can reap the benefits right now. Uh, but things can happen in our supply chain. Uh, if you recall, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, there was a ship that was uh, stuck in the Swiss Canal. So there, no matter how much automation you have, you are basically just sitting at home and then waiting for all the ships to reach the destination or uh, to your company. So uh, it, it, it really depends. I mean, when we talk about automation, we can't take a look at uh, from our industry perspective uh, uh, in, individually for our company only. We have to look at for the all the partners in the supply chain. Over to you, Sina. Okay. Now, uh, just one. Uh, while we've spoken about the deployments of each of your organizations, I'd now quickly like to move on to the to the wrap up round, uh, where I'd like to understand from you the futuristic outlook on uh, how do you think organizations should prepare for the age of hyper automation once they've uh, deployed an automation solution and scaled it to a certain degree? How are they gearing up for the age of hyper automation? Quick closing comments from each of you. Please keep it to the end short. Angus, we'll start with you. Okay. So I think the, the one thing is that um, in the in the in I mean not in the future nowadays we all see that the automation was driven by technology a lot and then everything actually comes from data so i think we have to do two things one is how to um model your data properly like storage and how to structure them that's one thing and then make them available so the data strategy is very important here and then Coming back to the things we talked about, security and the privacy. So data governance is the second thing. And it probably will become the very important thing very quickly. So from our uh, many of our, our conversations with other companies or clients, data governance is something that people actually don't still don't know how to do it properly. So it's either we are protecting too much or you are not protecting enough. So how to find the balance here to provide the right system with the right permission control and how to make everything efficient for everyone. That's very important. So yeah, that's, that's um, I think to my thought to this. Okay. Abhishek, quick comments from you on how you're preparing your organization for the age of hyper automation. Sure. Um, I think for our organizations, uh, culture and process is going to be playing a big role in the readiness to keep automating. Uh, and what I mean by this is kind of building digital first and standardized processes. Uh, very similar to what Angus said, I think it really matters how much 
data you have and how that data is structured because that really affects what value you get out of automation. Machines work best when the data available to them is in a standardized format. It also requires less work from your end to actually get some value out of that data. So I think the availability of uh, high fidelity and, uh, and a large amount of historical data is going to be key for any company. And this doesn't just facing, but I think also recording data that is, that is purely uh, in terms of a process uh, related to operations is going to be key to enable efficiencies at scale. At the same time, I think it's going to be important to instill a, a culture of constant improvement. Uh, I think one common misconception with automation is that once it's done, it's done. Uh, but automation kind of evolves just as any manual processes do. And a culture willing to constantly inspect not only what to automate, but how to automate better is going to be key for organizations uh, in, as you say, the age of hyper. This one? Yeah, sure. Um, definitely, I mean, when we look at that, uh, so certain functions you can go for automation right away. For example, cybersecurity, uh, IT support, etc., cetera, uh, finance, there you can go for automation relatively easier uh, in any organization uh, as compared to the production department or operations department of the organization. There you will have more challenges because none of uh, two companies operate in the, in the same way. So there you need to see that what your processes are, who are the people involved. If you are in manufacturing industry, definitely their challenges are much different uh, than the service industry. For example, in big four, automation may work very well. Uh, but for manufacturing companies, uh, unfortunately, there you need to uh, rely on the people. Uh, because definitely uh, you have automated machines, but still there are people. And uh, things may not go very well. Uh, you also look at the cycle. So generally in our industry, one cycle is roughly about two to three years. That means that when you uh, make the product, when you uh, get it approved and your end users are using that. So uh, it, it really depends on the length of cycle uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, F&B in a hotel uh, where the cycle may be about a month or less, maybe a couple of weeks where you get the response right away. So it really depends on the organization and moving forward, you need to see that how you are going to leverage on the data. More and more data are being available right now uh, and uh, it will increase further. So definitely uh, we need more people who can do the analysis and uh, who can use uh, leverage on the machine learning and artificial intelligence to make more reliable solutions. For the time being, I would say that RPA, uh, depending on the organization between 20 to 70 percent efficient uh, as uh, what is expected from them. And of course, that, that is just uh, based on my observation. Over to you. In the interest of time, I think we'll have to close it here. In these 30 minutes, we try to touch upon a lot of aspects right from the start of an automation journey for an enterprise, the basic building blocks, the do's and don'ts, uh, a basic uh, checklist of what they should do and what they should avoid. We also touched upon your respective uh, organization's uh, automation journey and how you've reached the benefits. And we've also talked about how uh, organizations in general should prepare for uh, the age of hyper automation, how they should gear up for this uh, next phase in automation. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today and sharing your insights and perspective on this topic. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for deep delving into the topic. With this, we'll move to the next session. Digital transformation is a business trend that has gained immense popularity over the last few months. Before the pandemic, while some businesses invested significant time, effort, and capital into digital transformation, others weren't too concerned about digitizing their offerings. However, COVID-19 has forced organizations across the globe to take radical steps towards adopting technological advancements to secure the business. 
In this keynote address, Dr. Jim Walker, Chief Economist, Alethea Capital Limited will share his expert knowledge on emerging trends in a post-pandemic economy. Welcome, Mr. Walker. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Economic Times Virtual Conclave in Singapore. This is uh, an exciting time uh, that uh, we're all in at the moment, given the, the pandemic beginning to recede and vaccines being rolled out uh, across the world. The, the, the prospect of some normality returning is, is very high in people's minds. But uh, there's not going to be a real normality returning given what's happened and, and what's happening in terms of technological advances, not just in the industrial countries, but in the developing countries as well. And uh, the theme of this conference, the creative destruction through technology, is very interesting to me because, of course, you can probably tell I'm something of a dinosaur um, and our type of economics isn't really technologically driven. But it is all about creative destruction. And that's what I want to focus on a bit today. So let me just bring up a... Okay, so um, the title of this presentation is American Flu, uh, which will become uh, evident as we, we go through some of it. But it is actually about creative destruction. And it's also about what has happened over the course of the, uh, the last year and the last 10 years. So, uh, as we all know, we've been in the middle of a pandemic since the beginning of 2020. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the prospects of uh, uh, vaccines being rolled out and uh, the pandemic subsiding somewhat uh, is what's keeping us all going. And 2021 is likely to be about economic recovery, quite big numbers, which won't be very difficult to achieve given how poor the base effect will be from 2019. But I'm afraid the end of the COVID-19 pandemic is not the end of the economic problems for the global economy. Over the course of the last 20 years, increasingly there has been a pandemic of bad economic policy making. It really is a virus never before seen in global economics. And it continues to this day, and it's very concerning. There will be a vaccine for COVID-19. At the moment, there seems to be no vaccine for the virus of bad economic policy making. What comes from this bad economic policy making? Well, basically, increase in zombie companies around the world economy, which has become the norm as a result of ultra easy monetary policies and especially exceptionally low interest rates in the advanced economies. What happens with zombie companies, and I'm going to come on to a definition of them later and just show you how prevalent they are, is that they, they stifle economic growth, they pre depress productivity in the economy, and they, they dissuade new vibrant companies from actually even starting up because they take up resources, uh, whether it's bank loans, labour, or indeed capital. This is what we've termed American flu, because the truth of the matter is that it started in America with the Federal Reserve. And the main characteristic of what happens with this American flu is that the banking system becomes very reluctant to let weak borrowers fail. Now, actually, uh, India has experienced something like this over the course of the last 10 years following the, the global financial crisis, when there was a a huge lending surge in India from the banking sector to uh, real estate to various industries. Uh, and then a big upsurge in bad debts as those industries found it very difficult uh, to spend the investment money wisely. And that then became an overhang in the banking system in India because the insolvency and bankruptcy code did not push people to push the banks uh, to find people insolvent. And the result of that was that uh, we've had a very weak banking system for the course of uh, the last few years. And we went into the pandemic, pandemic in India uh, in a weakened state. Now, the, the problem that uh, very low interest rates cause 
for advanced economies, this was a very different scenario from the Indian scenario, is that while supporting asset prices and lowering lending costs, what they also did was change the behaviour of the banking system. And the banking system found it much, much easier to resist putting uh, companies into bankruptcy and, and effectively supporting them by lending them money even when they weren't making much money. And the result of that was that the forces of creative destruction, which are absolutely essential to economic vibrancy, have been bypassed as a direct result of it. The, the adoption of ultra easy monetary policies, including zero interest rates, which is now accepted mainstream thought, has had major negative unintended consequences in terms of creating a zombie pandemic. Now, I said to you I was going to give you an idea of what the zombies are uh, and a, a definition of them. So the, the definition of zombie companies is companies that can't pay uh, their interest on debt from earnings. Technically, it's called their debt coverage ratio is below one. But it has to be below one for three years or more, and the companies involved have to be at least 10 years old. But how prevalent is the, the, the zombie pandemic? I'm uh, just making this up. Well, there's actually been a lot of research from uh, the, the BIS uh, in particular, and as well as the OECD, into the numbers of zombie companies. And you can see on the, the two charts there just how significant they have become. Uh, there's two types of definition. What, what we'll focus on is the, the broader definition, because that's what's usually used uh, by most people investigating the, the incidence of zombie companies. Now, in that chart, you can see by 2016, around about 12% of companies listed in the advanced economy share markets were considered zombie. Now, that has gone up to 15% in the latest research. And of those 15% zombie companies, the, the, the fact is that around about 85 to 90% of them will remain as zombie. They won't get better. And the result of that is that you get a huge amount of uh, lending activity and resources taken up by companies that don't ever disappear, even though they're not making very much money or not making any money at all. What are the, the drivers of this zombification? Well, at first, the researchers really thought it was down to the fact that uh, poor bank health would make banks stop uh, bankruptcy activities and, and therefore creating uh, more destruction in the, uh, the, the, the company sector. But in actual fact, what we've increasingly found with the research is that it's lower interest rates that cause this behaviour behavioural change in the banking sector. And those lower interest rates uh, support the increase of zombie companies. If we went back to that previous chart just for a second to let you see, in 1990, when interest rates were relatively high throughout the global economy, there were no zombie companies. As I say, by 2018, that had risen to 15% of the total of advanced economy listed companies non-financials. That means from our perspective that the advanced economies are thoroughly compromised going forward. The, the, the existing levels of zombie companies are going to depress economic activity, they're going to depress economic growth, uh, they, they, they reduce productivity and they hoard resources. And the fact is that given that that's the case just now, there's almost zero chance of interest rates being raised in case a number of companies fall over. So central banks around the Western world are now locked into very, very low interest rates and high levels of inactive firms. What we've basically called this is the Japanification of the US and Europe. We all know the problems that Japan has had in growing over the course of the last 30 years. I'm afraid those problems are now going to be passing to Europe and America. And that's very important in terms of the resumption of economic activity after the pandemic. Because in the past, it's tended to be the case that the advanced economies rebounding 
from recessions and from economic downturns uh, have pulled emerging markets along with them. Uh, emerging markets have tended to, in those circumstances, have slightly weaker exchange rates. And as those weak exchange rates exist, uh, they improve the competitiveness of emerging market exports uh, and especially manufactured exports. So as the advanced economies rebounded, the export growth engine kicked in for emerging economies. And that was one of the big ways that emerging markets usually recovered from crises. Not this time. If we are right in the analysis of that zombification of the advanced economies, uh, then I'm afraid emerging markets are going to have to do a lot of the, uh, the big thinking uh, themselves this time round. That's what's going to uh, bring back economic vibrancy to the emerging markets. That's going to include things like liberalisation uh, and reform of markets generally. Interestingly, India and Indonesia are quite far in advance of other countries in terms of the, the big thinking that is required. Over the course of the last year, um, as you probably know, in India, there have been introductions of la labour reforms uh, and agricultural reforms. Note that that one has been very easy to, to introduce. In Indonesia, uh, again, labour laws are being reformed, as are foreign direct investment laws. But this is exactly the requirement of countries just now uh, to avoid being uh, infected by the, the weak economic growth from the advanced economies. And here's why it can happen. The source of creative destruction uh, is market-determined reasonable interest rates. Uh, if you look at India and Indonesia, at the beginning of the pandemic, their interest rates were relatively high. These are official interest rates around about 5% mark. Of course, they've fallen over the course of the last year, but they're still high. This imposes a discipline on investment expenditure. It means that companies don't start businesses if they're not earning money. And it does impose a discipline on the banking system as well to get rid of bad companies as quickly as they can so that their bad assets don't keep growing. So India and Indonesia look good, along with the fact that they're uh, talking about market reforms. Vietnam uh, also looks good, and places like the Philippines and Malaysia, uh, not too far behind. Unfortunately, Japan and, uh, I'm afraid, Europe and the US uh, are not the kinds of uh, creative destruction enforcing countries that they used to be. I just wanted to mention China because it's a kind of important country around the world these days. Um, and it actually produced a, a much better performance during the pandemic than other countries. It, it had positive uh, export growth and positive GDP growth. Um, not as high as Taiwan and not as high as Vietnam, but uh, it was one of the big uh, surprise positive producing uh, countries in 2020. But that's not why China's an outlier. Unlike almost all emerging markets and certainly all advanced economies, what China was doing during 2020 was tightening economic policy. It had reduced interest rates very sharply at the beginning of the pandemic. But by the middle of the year, interest rates were actually going up in China. They were restoring normality. And of course, what that then does is signals to uh, businesses and signals to the banking sector that they need to be careful about what they're investing in, what they're borrowing for, um, and that the, the, they then produce much, much better quality uh, growth going forward and investments going forward. The positive growth dynamics in China, plus the positive policy positioning, augur very well for uh, the next cycle in China second largest economy in the world. It's not going to be growing at 6, 7, 8% again, as it did in the past. It's going to be significantly slower than that, but it's probably going to be growing at double to close to triple uh, what's happening in the advanced economies. And that's going to be a big export market for the rest of the emerging market universe. This just shows you the, the, the way that those interest rates rose in China um, through the course of 2020 from hitting uh, very weak levels uh, in April. 
they rebounded almost to 2019 levels by the end of the year. And uh, the second chart there shows what they call aggregate social financing in China. It's the, the banking system plus the shadow banking system. The, the, the tightness in policy making continued right through the second half of the year with China forcing down uh, some of the, the shadow banking system, trying to, to make sure that it didn't make the same mistakes as the United States did in the run-up to the global financial crisis when shadow banking took over the reins from uh, normal banking and made so many mistakes. I thought I'd just put up uh, our uh, strategy calls uh, for this year. Um, some of them reflect what I've just talked about. Uh, the long and emerging Asia uh, is our long-term view now that uh, emerging Asia holds a lot of the, the upside for the global economy going forward. And this is one of the things that you're going to be discussing a lot uh, during the conference because technology plays a huge part in this. Not in the way that I'm sure most of you think about technology in, in terms of your own businesses, but in terms of enlivening the markets of emerging countries. The adoption of mobile technology and technological digi digital systems in emerging markets is one of the, the greatest growth drivers that's ever happened for the emerging market economies. Instead of the physical infrastructure that drove the advanced economies and was always required to produce market information, technology now does that in the emerging markets. And the more that it's adopted, the faster the growth is going to be. So we're, we're long emerging Asia, short developed countries, and feel that is going to be one of the best trades going forward um, for the global economy and for investors in the global economy. These other um, strategy calls I'll let you have a look at yourself. We've actually closed out the long and dry bulk shipping because it reached our targets with a, a gain of 116%. Um, which is unusual for us, but uh, nice when it happens. Um, but most of these are, are related to, to Asia uh, and the rise of the region. Let me just finish uh, very briefly on India. As I say, the big thinking uh, is there in India just now. It's not just in terms of these structural reforms and liberalisations that I mentioned earlier, but actually we're seeing budget realism uh, for the first time in India in a long number of years. The, the, the last budget really was a statement of change uh, where transparency uh, and much better thinking about the, uh, the, the fiscal dynamics was in evidence. It was very understandable that there was a blowout in the, the fiscal deficit in 2020. That should have happened everywhere. Governments closed businesses. It was incumbent on them to support the business revivals. And that meant uh, fiscal expenditure going up, budget deficits going up. But at least now we have a, a very clear idea from India of what's going to uh, happen over the course of the next few years in terms of controlling the budget deficit, increasing capital expenditure, increasing commitments to foreign ownership, including the insurance sector, um, recapitalization and consolidation of the banking system, these are all huge positives for the Indian economy. In my view, um, if the government follows through in these, we're looking at between 8 to 10% growth uh, over the course of the next decade, probably making India the fastest growing economy in the world. Big thinking, technology, creative destruction. That's what's uh, the answer to glo global problems. Not ultra easy monetary policy and low interest rates. Enjoy the conference. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for giving insights on emerging trends in a post-pandemic economy. With this, we'll proceed for the next session. Stay tuned.
we live in extraordinary times. COVID-19 has forced businesses to adapt at meteoric speed. Many enterprises have reconfigured and reinvented themselves seemingly overnight, some re-energized by accelerated progress. These are the resilient ones. Reimagining resilience in a post-pandemic world means greater agility and flexibility than ever before, and systems and processes that allow organizations to scale innovation at speed. In the next fireside chat with Virak Thakkar, IT GRC expert, and Yashwen Singh, executive editor, ETCIO Economic Times, we'll discuss reimagining resilience for digital enterprise. Over to you, gentlemen. Hello viewers, I'm back again with an interesting fireside chat session. We live in extraordinary times. COVID-19 has forced businesses to adapt at meteoric speed. History has taught us this happens in a crisis, but it's no mean feat. Many enterprises have reconfigured and reinvented themselves seemingly overnight. Some re-energized by accelerated progress. These are the resilient ones. Reimagining resilience in a post-pandemic world means greater agility and flexibility than ever before, and systems and processes that allow organizations to scale innovation at speed. To discuss more on this top-of-the-mind subject of resilience, we have with us Mr. Virag Thakkar, an IT GRC expert, and he will throw more light on reimagining resilience for a digital enterprise. Welcome and thanks, Virag, for joining us. Uh, let me open up the discussion, Virag, by asking you a very pertinent question. COVID-19 is by far the biggest challenge organizations globally have had to meet in many decades. Were enterprises that had resiliency built in better prepared to meet this challenge? If yes, why and how? Thank you so much, uh, Yashwendra, uh, for uh, welcoming me. And good morning, everyone, and afternoon. Uh, welcome to Economic Times uh, Future Now Conclave. Uh, to answer that question, absolutely yes. If you look at the things around us, uh, if you look at the planning aspect of uh, any organization, we always uh, plan to fail, not fail to plan. And that's the key aspect of any, any organization when a resiliency comes into picture. And a lot of things have been uh, spoken about resiliency in recent times, but people often overlook uh, its dual purpose as well. It's not only about uh, recovering from crisis, but uh, going forward into a new era or reality. And taking early action matters too much uh, when it comes to business resiliency uh, as such. Also, it's all about looking ahead and how to do and what to do and how to respond recover from a crisis. And across the board, if you look at it, all the organizations that have implemented key actions uh, before 2020, before the pandemic struck us, uh, we were typically investing a lot into workforce and digital aspect of it. And rescaling of employees and redesigning of workspace uh, was one key and important aspect. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, there are two, and two things which changed uh, when the COVID happened. One was the cloud journey which played a very vital role in achieving resiliency uh, across the enterprise uh, with a lot of uh, factors which were not adamant before when we started the cloud. Now people were looking into cloud in a more uh, proactive approach rather than reactive. And with cloud, it helped a lot of uh, consumers and also the enterprises to track them and to attract them and make the businesses more uh, resilient. Uh, in that journey. And just to give you an example, like five, ten years back, uh, with the bank scenarios, uh, let's say there was a bank ATM fraud, uh, wherein someone did a skimming of a card. And when the card skimming happened, a lot of people flocked to the bank to see if their uh, money was still safe, or they went to the bank to see what their account balances were. And that put a lot of uh, stress on the banking infrastructure uh, from a people perspective as well as the IT infrastructure perspective. Uh, something went on a social media saying that this bank is going bankrupt and everyone would go to the ATM to withdraw cash. And that created a lot of traffic within a single day, which they were not equipped to do. So when the cloud came into picture and when the resiliency of the processes came into picture, this kind of uh, panic situation was not going to happen anymore. 
there are so many multi level dc enterprise architecture which has happened and which has been catering where a digital is a backbone of the services to be catered to and once this services were were in place especially during the covid where everyone had to work from home the vpn infrastructure had to be scaled up on an immediate basis uh, where physical devices were not required anymore uh, from an from an infrastructure perspective and every devices was allowed to connect uh, that the cloud became a key aspect of it so when enterprises had resiliency in plan uh, they did cater for this kind of eventual scenarios not to an extent where covid uh, came into picture they did not anticipate this much of a blackout per se but they definitely had some sort of a resiliency built in and uh, this this scenario was well calculated beforehand did definitely help them to overcome it and as i said with the bank example when you are prepared for a flash crowd and when you develop and exercise your run books and more importantly understand your business processes and risk associated with that you are able to overcome such sort of a challenges so yeah so in a nutshell yes the businesses who were had resilience built in were definitely much more better prepared to overcome this Thanks. sure Uh, great uh, virag uh, you know but uh, unfortunately lessons from previous tragic events are often quickly sidelined when karma sees uh, prevail that's basically human nature right and and this paves the way for business efficiency to dominate the focus again but companies uh, what we have learned from this pandemic is that they have to strike the right balance between resiliency and efficiency if they want to weather the storms over the longer term how can they achieve this balancing so, both yeah. right uh, there are three things when it comes to resiliency uh, and i will break it down uh, into a cyber security resiliency first which is basically refers to technologies and processes that can be deployed to protect it systems your networks and data from any of the cyber attacks which is uh, it is also part of a resiliency if a cyber attack happens and right now most of the companies are into digital transformation uh, they are into it 4.0 and uh, without you not being into a digital Uh, transformation aspect of it, uh, there is a very less likelihood that you will survive in your future. We have got multiple examples from Kodak to uh, another few of the companies. So, cyber security is one of the biggest aspect of it, uh, where it comes to resiliency. Second part of resiliency is the business resiliency. It's about companies' ability to, you know, continue in an event of a disruption. So, even if a disruption occurs, how fast are they able to run their businesses? and business continuity planning was always there but it was not in a prime of focus before covid happened now that focus has shifted to achieving that business resiliency which is not just on paper but it has to be implemented and practically done to so that the processes and the people and the technology all we are working and gelling together to so that aspect of it so along cyber security business resilience also is a very key aspect of it and the third is the digital resiliency now this is a combination of cyber and business resiliency as such both wherein it's the organization's ability to absolutely manage the digital risk the cyber risk associated and also continuously delivering the business services to its customers to its stakeholders to its partners to the supply chain in any other situation so all these three combined needs to be gelled whether any uh the to whether the right balance is between the efficiency and the resiliency when this cyber resiliency business resiliency and digital resiliency are put together in place uh the organization will be able to achieve the kind of resiliency scenarios as well as the security scenarios they wish to have it and as you said a lot of people did forget what happened in the past it's not that this is this this comes up uh they're not discussed before in the boardrooms they definitely were it's just that the focus was not there and the leaders even if you look at the, the current surveys which is done by deloitte and a lot of the big force uh, they still feel uh, the leaders in the boardroom are not aware of the risk associated with either the office they are they are more risk averse to the business risk but not to the digital risk and the cyber risk now with the technology leaders coming into picture and they are more have a more prominent place uh, in the boardroom discussions so these things are coming up um, and i will i will give you an example where in uh, i was 
quite surprised actually uh, one of with one of my organizations which i was working previously uh the chairman of the board uh, came and visited on a table top exercise which was a great not only a motivation but it also brought in the focus that he had in his mind and he understood the risk associated with cyber and it risk uh and he, he did realize that if he is not going to sit into the table top exercises where cyber risk and digital risk are not being uh are not understood by him he is not going to run his no he is not being able to run his business effectively so to answer that uh he he came across and he realized the importance of it and first put more time into and put more balance into uh, the business risk as well as the it risk and the digital uh, resilience risk associated with it sure sure virag you know you really beautifully explained the three pillars of resiliency great uh, moving on uh, uh, does becoming more resilient mean companies have to bring more services and systems in house to control risk Uh, you know is that the way forward because this is completely diametrically opposite to what cios are now being doing right they are uh, kind of outsourcing uh, critical application solutions taking them to the cloud not owning anything in house uh, what are your thoughts here uh no i think uh, it's uh, j- just because you are becoming more resilient does not mean that uh, there are more services or you have to deploy more systems in house uh it's more about controlling the risk it's more about strategizing and uh, reskilling and restructuring of uh, people and the processes around it uh it does not mean that uh, you are investing uh, in terms of capex and an opex it's about rejudging what your priorities and your risk are and to give an example uh, uh, the, uh nestle is uh, one of the big and the global conglomerate uh, or a fmcg fast moving the global group right so during covid 19 what happened uh, was they realized that if they have to deliver the good uh, along with the supply chain they need to understand uh, where covid is fast approaching and uh, what they did is uh, they built up a dashboard which was the data was already there with them so they did not invest anything on it they built up a dashboard uh, and track down to an individual zip codes uh, where they felt that there is a high risk of covid areas and once they had collaborated this data with their internal manufacturing and supply chain they realized that this area from this area we might not be able to get our raw materials on on this area or in this particular zip code will not be able to uh, deliver the goods so the ability to obtain that data from different systems within a short span of time uh, was already there the only change they had to do was to bring the data out and bring in redefine their processes and logistics and these key people saying that hey this is the area we are not going to deliver or this is the raw material that we are not going to get so let's restructure our processes let's restructure our production plan let's restructure uh, what we are supposed to do for the next foreseeable future to avoid uncertainties so the capability uh, of being well prepared and learning through the scenarios from a risk matrix perspective it it brought out a lot of things for them so it's not about investing a lot it's more about reskilling your people it's more about restructuring your current processes and changing the organization's dynamics as quickly and as agilely as possible to overcome this sure virat but what are the building blocks uh, when we talk about uh, resiliency what are the building blocks for achieving resilience that will place an enterprise's system in a stronger position to weather any economic crisis and lay a foundation for success right so in my perspective uh, there are three building blocks which comes into picture uh, one is the protection and when we talk about protection it's about knowing and protecting your crown jewels and crown jewels we have talked a lot about in the past as well uh, broadly this term is quite famous but still very less enterprises go ahead and actually adopt it or exercise it to a full extent so protecting your crown jewel uh, is one of the biggest building blocks till the time you don't know what you want to protect or what you want to achieve uh, out of the, your business resilience and disasters or even the business disasters you will not be able to go ahead with it so protection and knowing your crown jewels is one of the key elements second is the uh, performance and performance is not just about your systems or subsystems and processes but it's also about the partner ecosystem it's about the supply chain it's about the third party integration Uh, that happens overall so we need to ensure that all these three 
partner ecosystem, third parties inside uh, inside supply chain, inside processes are very robust and tested all the time to ensure the smooth operations and support certain prices and the situations uh, as and when it happens. And, you know, data center fire incidents are quite, I mean, it's not that common now, but it was quite common a couple of years back, especially in India, because of the power shortage and power fluctuations which used to happen. Although data centers were um, uh, level three and level four, but still it used to happen. So in, in case of that burnout, the partner, if there was not a strong partner available to deliver all the hardware, uh, it would be a very key problem for you to uh, continue with your performance and to scale up and to deliver what you're supposed to deliver. So performance in terms of all the eco, eco, three ecosystems that you have uh, from a third party to inside to the partners, uh, which needs to be there. And the last is the personalization. Uh, people are going to run the show uh, and you need to personalize the processes. You need to make them comfortable. You need to nurture them and you need to manage them. And personalization is not just for the customer's perspective. It's, it's uh, from the people uh, who are running the business for you as well. Uh, you need to know what their key strengths are, uh, what their key areas are, how they can be skilled if required on a short span of time, what are the kind of things that they will require uh, in terms of uh, continuing into a new version of a business. They are all mini CEOs or CIOs. And, and they need to, you need to know the strength and you need to know, you need to have more personalization approach with them uh, to run uh, the entire businesses. So I think protection, performance, and personalization, um, along with, uh, 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 will uh, put in a foundation in place uh, for your future. Sure. The three Ps, uh, as you would like to yeah. call them, Virag, right? Yeah. Great, amazing discussion there, Virag, uh, but we are fast running out of time. Uh, so, okay. one final question to you before we wrap up this session. Uh, what best practices should technology leaders adopt to build a more resilient future for their organizations? What would you suggest to CIOs and CISOs and CDOs to do to build a more resilient enterprise? So the, being a uh, information security and GRC uh, domain, uh, the first thing all, always comes to me is uh, this thing. Uh, you need to understand the risk uh, and the effects of it, uh, both negative and positive on an organization. Uh, before uh, going further on any of it. So to building a, as a technology leader, uh, you always need to think from a risk perspective. Uh, second is uh, cross-functional working. The uh, so CIOs are not only limited to IT anymore, uh, or the CTOs, the CIOs, or the CISOs. Uh, they need to, they work in across the group, they work across cross functions, and they are enabler to the business uh, rather than just continuation of a support system to the business. So discovering and creating and understanding new opportunities across the business and threats across cross-functional working and multidisciplinary uh, approach will help you uh, build more resiliency into the organization as a tech leader. Uh, third would be adaptability and the flexibility or the agileness of an organization. Uh, the more agile you are, more quickly you are able to take a decision and adapt uh, to the uncertain situation that happens overnight. Uh, most of the teams, uh, uh, most of the organizations, as you know, are shifted to from offline meetings to Zoom or team, Microsoft Teams or any other online collaboration platform, which happened overnight. So it was a very quick adaptability and agility as well, which uh, which was uh, given many organizations were not uh, able to think, but uh, it happened. And... Uh, Last is uh, encouragement and empowering uh, people uh, along with the culture aspects of it. Uh, once you have a mix of uh, culture and culture where there's a lot of encouragement and empowerment to an individual uh, if, to discuss the threats, to discuss how, what should be the management mechanisms to collect and analyze uh, data in those kind of adverse situations. Uh, how do we test the ability of an organization and its management to respond? Uh, that culture needs to be there. Uh, as I said, tabletop exercises are one of the ways uh, to deliver those things as well. So these are these are the kind of practices uh, which needs to be embedded uh, within the organization, especially by the tech leaders, uh, to be more resilient for the future. Sure. Great, Virag. Uh, thanks a ton for those amazing inputs. Uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, to sum up the discussion, resilience is top of mind for executives today, and it will prove to be a key factor for winning in the 2020s. As the world of business grows increasingly uncertain and volatile, companies that have purposefully developed capabilities 
to tackle ambiguity and unpredictability or in other words resilience are most likely to thrive with this we come to the end of this wonderful fireside chat thank you once again virag for those amazing inputs and thank you viewers for watching us thank you so much back to any Thank you, Mr. Thakkar and Yashwind. Now we have a tete a tete on the shape of deals to come. I would like to invite Mike Esteen, Chief Strategy Officer, Uncharted Global, and Vicky Makhija, Director, Consulting Services at PwC Southeast Asia Consulting, for the session. Over to you, gentlemen. Yeah, live news. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Hi, Vicky. How are you? Good. I'm fine. How are you doing today? I'm good. Early morning, my side. Um, in uh, South Africa at this point in time, a little, little bit stuck before I get back into Singapore, but um, enjoying the fresh morning on the side. How are you? Oh, all good in Singapore. I think everything is under control. and uh things are going well wonderful good stuff good stuff super so uh so my today we are here to uh to discuss what are the changes that covid has actually brought in in the corporate world for especially from an outsourcing strategy perspective uh cost reduction supply management uh you know underpowerment of 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 people and agility as we heard virag in the previous session as well that's the key today so I wanted to understand from your perspective over the next few uh, minutes how has outsourcing strategies really changed what has really brought uh, what are the perspectives that the cios and the caos are taking uh, in order to manage their overall outsourcing strategy please look i mean it's without a doubt that um, outsourcing is is this definitely front and center um, in most organizations the fact that you can't necessarily get stuff into a building um is 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 the immediate effect of that um you know so so outsourcing is um is a probably a good business to be in at this at, at this point in time you know from a from a contractor's point of view um but there's a lot of uh, things to consider um around that especially from a from an IT organization within the organization you know you have you have um renewed security protocols that you've got to you've got to follow and and um you have in you know you have things like insurance that you've got to update um you know that sort of is on par with what the world is today and including things like um uh, potential risk um 
um, from a systems a systems point of view, a systems down downtime point of view, because of you know certain key staff co- possibly contracting or getting ill. Um, you have um, you know you ha- you have uh, 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 mo- modifications um, in 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 these in these outsource contracts. Uh, we would have to probably increase capacity quite a bit, um, and um, you know, with 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 all of that, I mean, there's 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 certain elements of, of of risk associated. The other thing that's that's also come come into come to light is, of course, um, the the emergence of the the twenty four hour service desk with these with with these with these contracts as well. I mean, all of a sudden you are working across different time zones. Um, you would usually have staff and and, uh, and 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 situations where you'd have you know buildings, fixed buildings, and you have teams within the building that can communicate to each other, and and so forth. And and now you have you know either the same teams or outsourced teams, and um, you know possibly sitting in back in their home countries, like like me here, I am back in South Africa, and working across different time zones. And for that, you have to build in contingencies um, to, in order to run twenty four hours, but across different time zones as well. You know so massive amounts of things to consider and it's not it's not an easy thing for for the it organization especially for the cio and the, the you know the cto in in, uh, in in this position completely agree i think uh, uh key things that you touched upon what is the 24-hour service that needs to be now given to employees or clients uh second is the flexibility uh, that the vendors whom we have outsourced our contracts or in other ways, if we are the outsourcer, the flexibility that we have to show in terms of our uh, ways of working, in terms of the SLAs. Uh, how would you generally, and, and obviously most importantly, is the ownership, right? How do we take ownership of the contracts or, or while we are uh, doing the outsourcing, how does the vendor take the ownership of the contracts, uh, especially uh, supporting or, or manage ensuring uh, the service level agreements and other things are kept in mind. Now, in this entire uh, uh, you know new ways of outsourcing, how do you think transparency and flexibility play a role here? What do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on transparency and flexibility uh, when it comes to negotiating with vendors? When it comes to doing a fair judgment to the vendors as well as to how will they support us? Yeah, look, I think I think um, when it comes to transparency, before you even get there, I think it's it's in, it's crucial internally to understand exactly what these vendors would do for you and what they what they need to achieve for you. You know, you you're not in a position at this point in time to, um, you know, let's let's go back a, a year and a half ago, or a year ago. If you'd have a vendor that is that's that, you know off off site or even in a different country, if there's an issue, you could you you could get on the plane, you could go and sort it out. You can sit face to face, and you can sort of you know you you figure figure out the, the the issues. You know, here we are in a situation where you you can't necessarily do that anymore. And so, first of all, the strategy should be internally to really understand um, and rigorously go through the process of filtering through what vendors is best for whatever function you want to achieve um, across the organization. That's crucial. Um, that will then help you to then ha- um, put together a, a way more transparent um, contracting contracting process, and I think that transparency leads you leads into flexibility as well. You know, we need to understand that we are in a world that is relatively unpredictable. You know, from one month to the other. Um, you know, and of course, you can't you can't really look into a crystal ball here. But I think that flexibility needs to be there in order to um, you know to, uh, to 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 flex certain situations, whether that is capacity um, and, and so forth. And then I think lastly, just coming back to transparency, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just from understanding what you want to achieve and making sure that they, that they are, that the, the vendor is, is, is properly briefed, but it's also from a systems point of view, um, you need to make sure that, the, that, that whatever, you know, environment that they will be working on, that that environment is set up correctly. Um, right. Without the, the you know the the you know you know necessary evils that you would usually have in, in internally, it's no use you know setting this all up and you are providing an environment where or a platform where these uh, these teams will be working on where they are you know trying to figure out you know the the, the system or they're trying to make fixes or do create, creating bug fixes before they can actually do the job, and then to be in a situation of you know you know, where there's, where there's murky waters before they can actually perform, 
can lead to a lot of frustration. And even, you know, internally on, on our side, that is, a, that, is a, that is it's not an issue that we're sitting with, but it's a consideration that we need to work through to get to that. I don't think anyone has sold it 100% yet. You know, it's come yep. pretty quickly for us all. And I think it's a process that you'll probably see um, unleashing over the next, you know, sort of 12, 24 months. And, you know, and, and it's pretty, in a way, it's, it, it is exciting to see what's going to, you know, what the situation, what this, uh, the world would look like in, a, in, in the next year or two. As these, I think, you know, um, 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 processes and relationships unfold and mature a little bit more. Precisely. Uh, 100% agree with that. Uh, in terms of uh, the businesses as well, uh, I think now more and more uh, the leaders have started looking uh, the vendors as, as their partners now. So gone are those days where, uh, you know, uh, a vendor was just a supporting vendor on a business process or, or a part of the function of your business. Now, uh, vendors have been started uh, being imagined as business partners also to keep the lights on and to run a proper show. Uh, how do you think uh, on both sides, I mean, I can definitely say from PwC perspective, where we are l- treated more as partners and, and or business-driven partners rather than a vendor. What do you think is that balance uh, that happens in your scenario, in your context of a business vendor to a business partner? Yeah, look, I think I think um, I don't think necessarily you can you can look at a vendor as a vendor anymore, really. You know, especially when it comes to technology and and and, and you know, um, right. crucial keeping the lights on type of systems. It has to be a partnership. There's just no way uh, around this, you know. And and again, there, you know, uh, you know, the onus is all, all is on you as a company to really understand what you want this partner, if you may call it that, then um, to do and what you want them to achieve, and then be able to. To, uh, to very articulately, um, you know, put that into a, a, a contract process that is flexible, that is um, transparent enough and, and that puts you both in the position where you can perform, but also be able to flex um, or change when, when, when things changes again, you know, in, in, in right. the world and things that we, that's completely out of our control. You know, so I think in that case, there is, you know, a, a partnership is the only way to, to do this. You cannot, you cannot be in a position anymore where you have the sort of, um, you know, company vendor type of um, the situation. You, you, you pay a fee, you negotiate, you negotiate the hell out of, out of, out of, you know, the, the, the rates and, and, you know, and, and, and wanting, wanting the world for that rate. And now you just drive the vendor as hard as you can to, to perform. That's right. just not going to work anymore, right? It's, it's not going to work. So, so, so partnership is actually the keyword here. Um, and again, they, you know, you know, in some cases, you'd probably see a consolidation um, of, 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 of um, outsourced vendors, you know, in, in a way where organizations um, and used to have a multitude of different vendors doing different things. You might have a consolidation where because of this sort of partnership um, 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 focus on this relationship, that you would rather go for the two or three types of vendors that you know that it's not only just about the actual job and the function that they need to achieve. It's also about the relationship um, going forward and sort of making sure that you are in that position. So, um, you know, again, like not looking to a crystal ball here, but it will be interesting to see how this, how this works out um, in future. I think the last thing that is, that is pretty crucial as well is, is from a vendor point of view, is, is to be in a position where you are able to service, um, like I said, going back to the 24-hour service desktop scenario, you can service across different time zones and also be able to very articulately communicate. You know, again, right. one thing that's, that's, that's in the past, you could have outsourced to, you know, to, to, to areas or countries where you know, English, for instance, is not necessarily the norm and, and you can work through that and you have sort of teams that sort of manage, manage that and you would, in some cases, have your own some some of your own team on the ground in, in some of those areas or countries that sort of helps manage that relationship. I don't think that's that's viable anymore. So, so from a vendor's perspective, it's not just about just doing the actual job and and and, and you know the, the the you know performing against the contract. It's also being in a position where you know communication is absolutely crucial going forward in that whole process. Fully agree. I think and the communication. Uh, I think more than the problem, how is the problem solved nowadays is, is much more important. Uh, it's, it's the overall experience that matters when it comes to a vendor, uh, 
uh, relationship uh, engagement end to end whether it's on the business side a tech process side or a simple uh, it it vendor relationship with with that in uh, mind uh, you know considering uh, once covid started uh, a, a year back what are the key things that changed you know within your outsourcing strategy if i if i may really want to break down these uh, contracts into four four or five main buckets i think first let's talk about uh, for an organization uh, for internal it for support for internal employees uh, what do you think have been the changes uh, that have come across uh, that you've come across for uh, during the past one year and what kind of contracts are people looking at to set for another year we don't know how or how far will this go and when will this really settle so for internal consumption internal employee support Uh, considering their experience, considering the overall help that they need uh, from a day-to-day perspective, what are the changes you think uh, have come in? Oh well, you know the, the obvious big mass of changes. All of a sudden, you know you've got your IT department sitting at home, you know, um, and, and, and sitting scattered across different areas in within a country, or again within within sitting across or scattered across different countries and time zones. You know, so I think first. First things first, the people, the actual people. You know, we we always talk, we tend to talk about the technology and the support structure yeah. and the hardware that they need and stuff like that. But I think first of all, the actual people, the teams, um, the support that someone needs um, mentally. Um, um, in, number one is is absolutely crucial. I think that's changed a lot. I think there's a there's way more focus all of a sudden on em- employees and teams' mental health. Um, um and and s- making sure that there's a there's a, there's a proper support structure there um in order to help people through different challenges you know they you know it it is a real challenge all of a sudden where you have a a a really well performing team and all of a sudden they're not necessarily sitting together secondly people have different situations and setups at home which is right. not necessarily always you know a, 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 it doesn't have a positive effect on their ability to to operate and to operate. and to communicate you know it, you know I, you know one of our one of our guys for instance you know the the one day he switched off his camera and he was literally sitting in in a in a closet it, like it's looks like it would look like like oh. a walking closet because that was the only place where he could literally find some peace and quiet and and, and be able to really get his is job done you know especially when you think you you do talk about things like coding and you know working with 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 crucial systems and so forth you need to have that focus so you know so 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 i think mental health and and then and then and i think that support around making sure your teams are okay secondly together with that is working hours all of a sudden all of us are working way harder way longer Um, right. you know and it's never ending it was never ending before but now it's, it's like you know it's, it's like just tenfold all of a sudden so again making sure that you know when it comes to sort of internal team and contracting around that making sure that there's time off making sure that these people can take leave or can break away from from their their desks the desks on on a day to day basis you know so you know so so i think that those things are are really crucial so people first type of strategy is for me the most important aspect once you once you have that sort of in order and it's again it's not an easy thing then you come to the obvious stuff you know things like hardware hardware support all of a sudden is a a, a big challenge you, again you have people with, with you know with systems and computers and screens and whatever else at home and and together with the hardware support that seemed an absolute obvious you could call the IT team you can call someone that you could they could send out you know a person to you in the office or or at home if they, if they, if it's close and they could quickly sort it out now all of a sudden you don't you don't necessarily get to do that you know there's all sorts of measures and precautions and health precautions that goes with that you know so um again you, you from from a contracting point of view and possibly even from like an insurance point of view again you know you you now need to sort of update very quickly because if something happens what then um you know and 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 if you think about that the um the vendor you use or the, the the teams that you use to be able to supply these these hardware um and to be able to to support on this you know the the hardware aspect needs to be on top of their game because right. you cannot you cannot have systems that 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 goes down because of some mal- malfunction or someone dropped their their their, 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 their screen accidentally or whatever else and all of a sudden they can't they can't perform their job especially for the crucial you know aspects within the IT organization 
so you know so so that's a big one um and then and then of course together with all of that that comes in the, the the security aspect of it you know so all of a sudden you have you have you have possible gaps in security um you are not in that you know in the, again in that building or that office environment anymore um people are using different networks and and and, and different connections to sort of you know you know to to run at um you have different speeds and stuff like that and then of course it you know you, the you know the the big one that 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 anyone is sort of almost afraid to talk about is the 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 possibility of of, of new new type of cyber attacks that that's coming yep. into play you know so your security measures um i don't think any, uh, i don't think the organizations has 100% solved that um um and again coming back to things like um in insurance all of a sudden now you need to you need to upgrade your your insurance your cyber insurance specifically massively um and the old the old policies and things that used to used to cover you if in an event when something occurs i don't necessarily think is 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 um is up to date with with um with the, with the, with the new world and, and how we are structured <laughs> so again i think we can we can talk about this for hours and hours and because mm-hmm. there's so many complexities if you start to pull it across but i think those are sort of the main the way, the main one and just coming back to a, a people first strategy is 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 the most important aspect of this. If you don't have people that can perform because of different issues or mental health issues or just being completely overworked, you you just you just not going to perform. Doesn't matter what happens. Undoubtedly, I think I think keeping people at first, uh, uh, making sure there is cyber insurance, making sure the vendors are comfortable, and at the same time, uh, you know they they adhere to what they're supposed to as far as contractually is concerned. I think all of it. together is equally important um so thanks for that uh what about external facing applications what about client facing uh, uh, individuals what about in in scenarios where we are outsourcers uh by by our clients where do you think is there has the difference been in this scenario where uh, times where where you actually subcontract your work and uh, you outsource a part of your function but what happened what is your experience when you were a part of the outsourcing function rather than uh, at the at the at the receiving and rather than at the giving end what are your thoughts there yeah look i mean um yeah i think i think i mentioned it earlier in the conversation but but when it comes to to outsourced um um you know it's being in it's being in the vendor scenario whether you are you are actually one actually outsourcing or or the 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 actual the actual vendor um you know they the the good news here is you know we're talking about all the challenges and risk but the good news is here is that there are companies that that has set themselves up really 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 well in right. in the past and i and um and you know there's there's there's, there's a bunch of uh, uh, companies and or countries where you know outsourcing has is you know the you know almost like bread and butter you know Correct. you know you you t- you're talking about A, a, a couple of you know the the obvious ones you're talking about Vietnam you're talking about India you're talking about South Africa um you know you're talking about these sort of of countries where you know, you know there's 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 companies and teams there that is really well equipped to deal with us um and 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 they were you know i think in in a lot of cases what we've seen is that they were very quickly to respond to the new world and, and the challenges of that that covid brings and be been able to sort of you know scale up their teams and 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 their, their their systems in order to to take on this opportunity so you know um for, from a vendor point of view or an outsourced um um in, in uh so sort of almost like industry vertical point of view i think there's massive opportunities i think the um you know the the, the companies who are set up well um and are able to uh, um you know not only just to achieve the job function but be able to um um communicate and relate well and be able to understand the the different business needs very clearly from um you know um fr- from the client um is going to do extremely well and we've seen some of the some of these companies really you know if you see some of the financial results of some of these companies for over the last year it's a it's a it's it's just a it's a, it's just a great opportunity um on the other hand um the um the you know I, from from a, from a from an external applications point of view for me for and for us you know th- this is one of the one this is one of the challenges you know if if you don't have 
as a as a as an organization is if you don't have a a, a well set up and defined environment which is secure and all, all of these things for these you know companies and vendors to work within um, or operate um, 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 within the sort of your external applications you're gonna you're gonna have massive issues it's 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 no use trying to you know let them operate um, on on external applications but um but uh, you know, sort of your 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 base infrastructure and stuff does does not necessarily allow for um, 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 scalability. Um, it does not necessarily allow for um, um, being able to uh, achieve the, the the job at hand and on time because of other underlying issues. You know, and right. and certainly uh, and certainly on our side, we've had to go and relook. Um, you know, how does that structure look like? It's all good and well to outsource and all of a sudden get some more capacity. Um, but if you not putting those, the, the, those teams in a position where they can perform because you have, you still have underlying sort of core infrastructure um, issues um, or, you know, you know, they, they need to sort of problem solve before they can actually do the actual job. You're going to have problems. And that, and that could lead to, you know, issues around the contract piece. It can lead to issues around the cost the cost is, you know, the cost environment where all of a sudden, you know, you, you, they are, you, the, the double hours gets charged because you're basically trying to solve and, and, and fix and then actually get the job done. Right. Um, you know, so, so th that's an area that I think that, that will, that will hopefully, uh, you know, you, you're mature. And I think, you know, just going to, going into the opportunity piece, I think there would be, you know, companies, a few companies emerging over the next, you know, year or two that will, possibly specifically solve that 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 issue where you know you know if you if you do outsource and you do want a vendor to to operate within an external application or external applications you know how does that framework framework works looks like because there's actually not a re, not actually a, a proper a real proper standard out there everyone sort of does what they what they what they what used to work what's for more them convenient and uh, yeah and what's the need yeah. Right. Uh, wh while you say this, you know, especially around support, or especially around uh, all of this, do you feel there is a uh, there is a need for bridging the talent gap between these vendors and and the outsourcing contracts? Do you feel there is a need uh, uh, for for an actual talent gap? What we as 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 the leaders are accepting and and what we see in our outsourcers, do you feel that is the case in in many in some scenarios? Or a talent gap? Yeah, I think I think that there is a talent gap, but there's different reasons for that. Um, you know, I think you know, as as you as more and more companies would probably possibly start to outsource some of some of those key functions, it is actually, it's actually crucial that you have the right capability and 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 then people that sort of running running that and teams, right? So. It will be interesting to see how, for instance, the HR organizations works together with, with you know, the internal HR organization. It would need to start to right. work together with the vendor, for instance, in this case, or, or the partner, to ensure that the team of people that that or that that now performs a certain fo form of outsource function is the right, you know, uh, 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 person, and and they have got the right capabilities, and you know, have have the necessary technical skills, but even more so. You know, how do you how do you then manage culture? You know, Correct. it's easy to manage culture when you're in a company, but all of a sudden, if you are scattered around the world and you are, um, you know, how do you manage that culture? How do you get that culture, that working culture? You know, and and what, what makes you perform well? How do you get that in place? And and it, I think I think you know, outside of the, the talent cap, I think they 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 will probably well, they will have to be a a much closer relationship between. The different HR organizations between the actual, the actual, you know, the organization yep. and the and the and the, and the outsource partner, um, in, in ensuring that you, that you do have the right the right team of people. I think one of the challenges, even before the, the COVID world, that that you would have as a, a, in a, in an outsource relationship is is the amount of staff turnover um, you know, that you would have. You know, you know, in my previous role, we had we had a we had a team um, an outsource uh, relationship. Um, some of those teams were sitting in our office, but you know, every couple of weeks there's new people within that team. We and you have no control over that, you know. So you're almost like in a constant, uh, a constant position of onboarding, 
because mm. every couple of weeks, you know, the, the vendor would bring in new teams as they would sort of you know, jump from one project to another. And you literally walk into the office and there's two new people, right? And now you have to sort of spend time to make sure they're onboarded. You need to make sure that they are. It's not just about getting the job done. It's getting the job done the way that you want the job want. To, to be done. Yeah. And, 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 and making sure that that is measured against your, 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 um, 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 your, your, your key KPIs and, and so forth as an organization. So, yeah. So, so I think, I think that the, the talent gap again, possible opportunity there for, for a couple of, you know, for companies to come in and, and also sort of maybe manage that better, you know, the way that, 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 that talent is looked at, the way that talent is accessed, uh, the way that for, for people and talent to actually put themselves forward. Um, whether in a, in a, in a vendor or an organization or a, or a, or a, or, a, or the, or the key, the, the, the key um, institution or company. Um, and then lastly, again, uh, maybe again, the good thing about this whole thing is, is that now that the world is used to being fully distributed, all of a sudden you do have access to new talent, um, that, that you would probably have ignored in the past, you know, because of being in a, an actual office building and the need to have them. In, in an actual office building. So, so I think that's one of the good things that's come out of that. All of a sudden, anyone and, um, that, that is talented can actually now uh, get into a job or a role or a function um, because it's, 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 more, it, it, it's, it's, it's more open. And the companies are more open to that, to that idea. Wonderful. Super. I fully agree with, with what you said. I think uh, the companies can uh, benefit significantly from choosing... Uh, uh, the right outsourcing partner that can give them uh, a constructive suggestions to help them uh, meet their needs, and not just today, but in the future as well. And at the same time, uh, service providers uh, should, in with, with this new strategy of outsourcing, should understand who their clients are, uh, what's their business, and how should they uh, be willing to invest in this relationship so that they go uh, beyond that SLA kind of a discussion or a vendor um, a relation than more to a business partner, and and from from the yeah. organization side, I would say, uh, uh, I, I would easily say, you know, leaders who who paid attention to this, uh, maybe before COVID and and when COVID started, have really uh, and I have invested in supplier relationships, have fared better. Uh, they have managed this entire one last one year of COVID uh, much more better than organizations who some of the organizations who struggled. And, and their entire way of thinking around this vendor management relationship uh, and the entire overall experience, the employee experience that they've bought in uh, during this one year of uh, almost lockdown and work from home kind of an arrangement have really benefited well if their outsourcing contracts have, have gone the right way. So wonderful, Mike. With that, uh, I think we are almost at the hour. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I hope uh, it was uh, a useful conversation and uh, hoping... Our viewers also have a little more understanding of how outsourcing is being done in today's uh, environment and uh, what are the possible areas they should look at uh, while deciding uh, their next contract. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks, Vicky. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. AI is expanding opportunities for BFSI companies by providing a better understanding of customer requirements and expectations so as to provide personalized services. In the next panel discussion, experts will discuss the topic, the era of intelligence in the BFSI sector. I would like to invite Sneha Jha, editor ETCIO, to moderate this panel discussion. Over to you, Sneha.
Good morning, gentlemen, and welcome to the ETCIO Future Next Conclave. The topic for our discussion is era of intelligence in the BFSI sector. Now, a classic example of creative destruction is the BFSI sector. Today, BFSI companies are trying to reconfigure themselves to a new reality in order to extend the reach of financial services directly to the consu consumers' homes. In the BFSI sector, the road to customer centricity, growth, and competitive advantage runs right through data-driven intelligent technologies. Intelligent technologies have been around for a while, but during the pandemic, the BFSI organizations have started to realize its considerable potential. The pandemic has pushed the BFSI sector further and faster into the future, a future where intelligent platforms will drive the next wave of growth. With that as the context, I'd like to start off with, uh, with Sarat. Sarat, we are witnessing a creative destruction of the BFSI sector, such that the organizations are redesigning their business models around AI, ML, and technologies underpinned by data and advanced analytics. They are leveraging intelligent platforms to provide a relevant and timely value proposition to the customers. How should a bank begin its AI journey in this era of intelligent, intelligent banking? Thank you, Shania. <clears throat> um, very, very good question. And I think from my perspective, if I, if I reflect on the AI, it's, it, to me, it's more of a human and machine working side by side rather than having just the machine takes over, does everything, especially the empathy, the intuition, the judgment aspects of the human. This really reminds me of the famous chess game in 1998, an amateur with the help of a computer, lit, he beat uh, Kasparov who was the grandmaster champion at that point of time. And he also had an access to a computer. So it's, it's a demonstration how in, in, in the real world of AI, you know, the myth is around AI doing everything. I think that is probably not that true. I think it is best um, AI adoption in banking center when it's working with side by side with human. Just two or three things that what we do, <clears throat> I personally, I think I think like every every other thing that you do, you start to plot a graph, you know, on one side, you look at your competitive advantage versus and look at the degree of intelligence that you want to bring in. And otherwise, you would not be doing a justice to the particular job. So uh, we, I, I follow a very, you know, um, very systematic approach. For example, I start with the report, you know, with the learning the event, what exactly the event I'm just trying to, you know, bring an AI in. And then I look at to inquire about, look at, the event, look at the inside of the event. Then I probably look at to analyze what did the event, why did the event take place, for example, and then forecast what will happen if I deploy this AI solution yeah, to my customers and then obviously optimize. So these are the, some of the mechanics that we use in, in the bank. And as I said, you know, once again, it is a combination of AI is best when it is done with a human being. That's right. Sarah, thanks for pointing out that angle. Uh, I'd like to take it a step further with Casper. Uh, Casper changes as much about people and processes as it is about technology. Now, you represent a bank, Rakaif Indonesia, which is the oldest and the largest bank in the country. So I'm sure you have to deal with a lot of legacy. What are the kind of changes that are required in the short term and long term mindset and the organizational culture to facilitate the adoption of AI? Thank you, Sneha. I think echo with Sarah. Um, I remember Satya Nadella in his book said, I like to think that the C in the CEO stands for culture by adopting a growth mindset, right? So this is what we believe as the key to winning in the digital transformations and adopting digital initiatives, including AI. So big changes require an open mind, right? So that's the context first. So to have a growth mindset, I think we need to be open for new challenges and new approaches to problem solving. So I think one of the quick win in the short term, I think we could use uh, some of the frameworks made from the Silicon Valley, I think the 3D, build, borrow, and buy, right? So if you cannot build by yourself, you can borrow from someone else's partners. If you, can, if you cannot buy, borrow as well, you buy it through your venture capitals or with your m and teams. So that is something that we focus on organic growth, for example, in the build, uh, by building capabilities for AI. In the borrow, we can collaborate with other tech firms or startups for shared benefit in a strategic partnership for that. 
And the buy one, you can partnership through financing, investments, also and M&A for the AI capabilities and technologies. So, and other short-term wins also, we can start with leveraging our unfair advantage. You know, every organization must have their unfair advantage, whether it's their biggest assets, their biggest networks, or biggest data. So leverage this unfair advantage with AI as a quick win. For example, creating a recommendation engines based on your structured data. And then you can combine that later with unstructured data to get cross-selling and upselling more contextual. And last but not least, I think, utilizing uh, available publicly AI solutions in the clouds and moving them scalably from there once you've got attractions is also one of the biggest wins that we could um, get in this market. So with this growth mindset, we will able to keep the customer-obsessed focus in developing our sustainable initiatives through the utilization of AI. And hopefully we will create based on what the customer wants and needs and evolving as they progress and even create a new uh, demands or new needs. I think that will be uh, insights from us in Indonesia. Back to you, Sneha. Uh, Mike Casper spoke about how an old world bank uh, is, uh, you know, getting in, is uh, entering this era of intelligence by recasting its business model, uh, you know, re-looking at its uh, business imperatives. So uh, as banks enter this era of intelligence, how are you reimagining your platforms and solutions to be able to help them? And what impact has the pandemic had on your approach? How has it changed your approach? Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, um, look, the pandemic hasn't really, really changed our approach. I think it's fast track the approach. You know, we, we, you know, I, I think I think what the one thing that the pandemic has done is you you can't necessarily if you haven't been in a position where you understand what you need to do when it comes to digitization overall and the you know, use of you know data and, and the architecture and everything around that um you know i think you're a, you you're in for a bit of a shock right i mean you, you i think you know the pandemic has basically just put a big flashlight on what you need to do and what you need to fast track so on the, from from our perspective yeah so from our perspective it's just it's definitely fast track uh, our approach you know it's it's easier for smaller organizations um, to sort of um, um, to, to look at, you know, things like ground up, ground up systems, you know, 100 percent cloud. Um, and, and of course, the advantages that cloud brings when it comes to, of course, data and, and, and the utilizations of unstructured data and, and, and AI and, uh, around that. Um, you know, so so in, in, in that case, um, our, from our from our perspective, the, the the you know everyone talks about the the benefits of ai and how ai can help and we all understand you know the importance of ai going forward especially in the financial services world when you think you talk about risk management and risk scoring um and you know your credit decisioning and all these things but i think one of the crucial aspects is you you need to step step one step back is is that architecture that you would need um to in, in order for AI to really come as a come come to fruition and uh, be and benefit your, your 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 setup, we have a we have a very strong um, focus on on making sure that that core architecture is is done right, and that architecture includes your from uh, it includes your systems, uh, but it also includes your data architecture and your data policies and how that how how that gets used. If that is not um, done right, and that requires uh, quite a bit of work. But if that is not done right, adding AI on top of on top of a system that is that is not necessarily right for it is never going to give you the result. And I, th I think we've seen a lot of challenges in, in in that in that space where there's a rush to to you know to acquire AI um, in, in an organization where it doesn't necessarily in the end give you the result that you want because of an underlying architectural um, um, or a fundamental architecture. Um, disadvantage that, that, that you that you might have, whether that is legacy systems, uh, whether that is just the, the actual business model that goes around it. And there's, there's a whole bunch of things. But that is one of the crucial aspects that needs to be done, be, be done right. And then, of course, you can then start to get the benefit of, um, of AI in things like unstructured data and then all the other, uh, you know, the obvious benefits that come from that. Mike, you spoke about data architecture, and in in some ways, you were uh, you were talking about getting your house in order before you even um, embark on AI, and uh, you know identifying very clearly and concisely what are the use cases that lend themselves well to the adoption of AI. That's that's the uh, you know 
first stepping stone towards uh, ai adoption now uh, sarat i want to understand from you how a standard chartered is uh, is leveraging the intelligent platforms and ai to improve customer experience because customer experience is the big battle cry for bfsi organizations right now absolutely you know um when i when i try to reflect back uh, you know <clears throat> the kind of experience we provide to our client yes the bank the bfi as an industry has done a, a, a huge amount of work over the last decade or a decade and a half so you know automating a lot of um, flow between the customer and, and the bank and you know whether it is an erp integration whether you talk about api all these things are you know happened over the last 10 years or so but but there is still a huge opportunity lies in terms of how we can further enhance the customer experience i mean take for example you know trade operation you know um uh, we 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 are about in, in 40 plus countries where you have you know process the trade um tra- documents to facilitate a particular you know buying buyer and seller you know transaction and on an average every uh, every transaction involves not less than 20 documents whether it is a bill of lading whether it is shipping clearance whether it is insurance document there's a whole set of documents that are required by the client to submit you know either the client you know uh, collects them all of them and then submit to the trade operation uh, in the branch and then branch collects them scan them over to the shared service center and then the whole process starts but i think with the evolution of the ai you know there is a huge opportunity to turn that experience you know from a paper experience to a, a digital experience we had some we have done some pilot i wouldn't say that we have completely you know changed the world of trade operation uh, from a manual paper to a completely uh, digital automation yes we have done some uh, pilot but i i think our experience has not been that great where it is completely you know trying to read let's say for example bill of lading bill of lading in country singapore would look a, look very different to a compared to a bill of lading in indonesia or in thailand or in india or in vietnam and the question is it's it's a huge challenge for any artificial intelligence product that are available today to really infer the same document in different way yeah the whole idea was to you know uh, you read those document intelligently and convert the unstructured to a structured you know data and then push those data into the various engine for doing all straight through transaction i think that that uh, space is improving you know what was there three years back two years back is very different today but there is still a lot of work to be done in the industry where you know at one point at one day i would see the 20 documents are completely you know converted to a structured with probably less than 5% exception but today the exception is anywhere between 30 to 40% which means that you know you run an artificial intelligence uh, process and then spend about 40% time it doesn't really give away a true experience to the client and so therefore uh, sorry for interrupting you but a very briefly if you could tell me has ai in any way helped you uh, per- identify customer needs proactively uh, personalize uh, products and offerings for them you know reach out uh, to them through intelligent digital channels has that uh, in terms of customer outreach cross sell are you seeing any uh, use cases have you seen any business impact in those areas i think if you look at it has definitely helped the bank internally that part is that part is good i think a lot of data has been used using the ai engine to do predictive analysis lead generation you know the 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 customers repayment history the pattern all those things are great but i think if you look at purely from a customer experience point of view i think you know, we still it's a, it's a journey and we're still doing a work and i think the industry also has to play a bigger role and given it's a regulated institution and it's not what an it vendor versus what a somebody in the bank decides you know we'll have to go knock the door of the regulator to certify before we go back and offer so that a- aspect come in so yes customer experience is improved there's a lot of intent there's a lot of hope and and i could see probably in 2 3 years time probably all banks in the bfi industry would, would tremendously change the customer experience um you know landscape in in a much more you know digital way or th- that kind of aspect mm-hmm. 
Okay. Now, uh, Kasper, uh, Sarit spoke about how um, customer experience is an area where AI is still work in progress, and before it shows any tangible, uh, quantifiable business benefits, we got to wait it out and you know see how uh, the whole technology pro uh, progresses and how it can be applied to this area. Now, you. Um, being the oldest bank have a mind field of customer data i'm sure you have a very large customer base as well uh, so how are, how uh, do you see intelligent platforms or ai helping you identify some of the uh, customer blind spots and how are you able to address that with the help of ai right so let me cut to the chase i think so echo with sarah and mike earlier i think um Bombi or i uh, as the largest and the biggest network in indonesia right um Previously, before 2017, uh, the way we uh, disperse originations of loans until disbursement, it took about two weeks. And then since we started the digital transformations, applying AIs and customer experience, crafting some of the most uh, uh, high tech and high touch as well. So we are able to push the originations until disbursement in less than two days. But in 2019, we pushed forward, we went 100x, and we are able to uh, now originations to disperse less than two minutes. So basically, our customers just scan the face, scan the ID, money disperse in less than two minutes. <laughs> and it makes exponential growth for our uh, lending business, uh, digital lending business. And it provides us a more a confidence, I think, in terms of managing the risk and also managing the portfolio. The second part, I think, one of the biggest pain points in Indonesia, besides the digital lending, yeah, besides the lending, it's the uh, um, in the, some of the tier three, tier two cities, and also rural banking. They are um, unpleasantly uh, they have to go further to the uh, uh, bank branch offices. But I think we solved it since 2015 until today. We're introducing by the name of agent banking our product by the name of BRI Link, Brilink Agents. So we solved it by introducing this online, offline, O2O solutions where they just go to the nearest um, agent of us. They're not our employee. They are our agent. Therefore, whatever they want to cast in, cast out, pay the bills, pay the um, uh, some other billers, it's very easy for them. And last year, we scored one of the biggest in Indonesia, uh, 1,000 trillion uh, rupiah, and closed our fee based income 1.2 trillion rupiah. We've had uh, half a million of agent banking across nationwide in Indonesia. So, this stuff without having to burn money, you know, no discount, no cashback, no that kind of stuff that being done by the unicorns, so called, right? So, that's the biggest thing I think that impactful in our. Um, ecosystem. The last but not least is, of course, the advance of open API. So we're lucky we were the first in the uh, in the market in Indonesia who got the license of open API in 2018. And since then, the growth is exponentially as well. So now we are able to connect with 75% of the fintechs in Indonesia, all using our open APIs, whether it's for virtual account, savings, um, direct debits, and so on and so forth, including the lending uh, we provided all the APIs to them. So this is how we accelerate the financial inclusions and economy inclusions in Indonesia by working together, coexist with the fintechs. And we don't consider fintech as our enemy, but they are our partners, coexist, living together with them. Back okay. to you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mike, uh, financial services now revolve around the idea of customer convenience and uh, simplicity of operations. But being simple has its own set of complexities. So uh, trying to keep services simple and convenient for customers uh, will require a complex technology underneath. How do you manage that entire piece? Yeah, look, I mean, um, it just, you know, it, it's amazing, Casper. I mean, what you guys have done and achieved in, in a place like Indonesia. I mean, um, you know, I, I come from the emerging market work and I, world, and I always believe the emerging markets is where the, the innovation will, will really happen. There's that leapfrogging um, 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 this type of uh, type of um, uh, theme that's that's happening. So uh, in incredible to hear that. Um, you know, the customer experience as as um, as as is moved on massively. I, everyone talks about omnichannel approach, but I think it's actually moved on. I think I think we are we are missing the point here. It's actually omnichannel has now moved into a full multi-commerce, uh, a multi-channel commerce um, type of environment. You know, omnichannel used to be purely be able to communicate to your customer in different ways and means. We now have a multi-commerce uh, or a multi-channel commerce in, environment where 
transactions is also now taking place in, in different channels um, and, and environments, whichever is convenient for the customer or whichever is um, is a choice for, uh, for the customer. You have different chat services, you have different social media channels, yeah, um, you have of course the telcos coming up with different and innovative ways to 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 interact with the customer in in far reaching areas and places and 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 creating that access for them. And I think access is one of the key things that's that's starting to open up where you have the sort of the people in the sort of tier one tier two cities that can now that can now interact with a bank and can interact with a financial services company or the insurance company and stuff like that. Um, the it is absolutely. Key, uh, a key responsibility of the organizations to 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 look at a multi-channel commerce type of uh, type of approach and what that effectively means is a reverse engineering from what the customer needs are absolutely the, 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 not, not only the customer needs but where what, what is crucial for the customer to to be able to access any form of service and um, and, um, and, and, and tool shed and if you reverse engineer from from that side it is pretty scary, you know, from a, from a systems point of view, what you need to do and achieve and how fast you need to move and scale. I think the, the collaboration between the institutions like the banks and the large insurance companies and, uh, and the, in the, 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 not even the startups, but technology companies out there um, and, you know, the fintechs and the insurtechs and so forth. Um, is is the only way that this this is going to going to work well? It it, it puts the, the 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 institution, the bank, or the the insurance company position where they they can move pretty quickly. They can you know throw things over the fence you know and, and test uh, test environments pretty rapidly in a low cost, low risk um, you know speed to market type of type of scenario um, and learn learn more and learn fast and then you know look at a way to sort of bring that back. And then on the other side. The, uh, the, uh, the the with with regards to the fintechs and the insurtechs, it puts them in a in a position to really go at this this problem solving statement um, and opening up um, accessibility. And I think that's the key word for 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 the customers. When whichever environment these customers which chooses to interact in um, on 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 a day to day basis, you know. So uh, I I believe you know you know omni channel moving to multi channel uh, type of commerce. Um, is possibly the biggest opportunity currently. And I think, you know, the emergence of COVID has done that process a massive favor. I, 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 believe, I, I, I I'm a glass full type of person. And I think, you know, all, a lot of things that we've been struggling with in, in these type of um, environments, the, 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 the institution, the bank and the, the insurance company, uh, uh, together with some of the, 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 the technology companies and the uh, startups and stuff, you know, there's, 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 there's been this sort of divide in a, in, 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 in a slight way. There's organizations that's done a great job with the API frameworks, but they, there's been a bit of a divide. COVID has now sort of forced all of us in together into one, in one pool to try and solve the problem and really start to so solve the problem on behalf of the customer, which we all are. Um, and, and that's, that's fast track this process. So, you know, I think it's going to be very, very um, interesting to see uh, what's going to happen over the next two to three years as we move into this multi-channel um, commerce um, type of environment. And, it, you know, when we just start to take hold of it and then, you know, you're seeing how we could utilize, you know, ground up technologies, um, consume capabilities and technologies out there and then put that together in order to service the customer um, and, and also, uh, then, uh, of course, to, to then to understand the customer so that that all leads to, you know, utilization of data structured and unstructured and to build in the end to build better products. And I think one of the key elements that we that we haven't really touched on is the, the emergence of um, the data and AI specifically and helping to build better products and services for, for customers, you know, creating sort of this ecosystem of products and services for customers. Um, right. That is still, I think, lagging. Point in, in the forthcoming question. <laughs> right. Okay, thanks, Mike. So, uh, Sarath, you spoke about um, customer experience. What are some of the other areas, uh, some of the other business areas where you're looking at deploying API? Sorry, AI. I think it's, 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 it's industry-wide. You know, most banks, large banks like us, obviously are focusing on where, you know, we can really... A make a huge difference to the to the client experience, the customer experience, and improve the process efficiency. Yeah, and I think I, I talked about the trade operations. It's it's massive, you know, uh, you know millions of you know doc 
documents that that goes through a trade operation is a huge opportunity if we can you know get into that obviously this whole client due diligence kyc cdd process you know we are trying to you know get to see whether or the what's the what's the background if a particular signatory in a particular company and then what are the you know the background checks and all those things are you know coming into play similarly anti money laundering fraud detection these are some of the low hanging fruit like every single bank are really deploying you know because that gives a as i said in the beginning you know when i look at what is the degree of sophistication intelligence that i want to bring versus you know how much of process efficiency or that i'm going to gain uh, so these are these are the some of the area where ai is a no brainer can definitely improve the process efficiency and give a better client experience there is one other area where we have done some work in terms of fast tracking monetization and that is something very close to my heart because my role is largely in monetizing our uh, uh, our transaction if i look at a particular product that when we offer to a client you know and typically if you take an example if a car manufacturer there is a distributor you know if the distributor wants to have a finance arranged through the manufacturer the bank plays a role every time a particular car is sold from it from a dealer's uh, showroom and then um, bank pays to the manufacturer instead instead of the distributor paying them so this was all happening in a, in a manual way you know like bank have to go making sure that you know the car has been really sold physical inventory has been depleted etc etc but now with all the sophisticated digital ai based solution as soon as a car is sold goes out of let's say 500 meter out of the showroom and then a bank gets a notification saying look you know what the car has been sold please make the payment to the manufacturer so these are some of the proof of concept that you know as we have done but i think um, as i said once again you know time to deployment in the banking bfi industry is a much longer and complex topic as compared to a, a non regulated organizations of the retail industry or you know uh, or supply chain industry where if, if the company finds the product great if the solution is great you can deploy next day mm-hmm. as a bank we have to do a lot of due diligence before it can bring in so yes i think the future is definitely there a lot of work in progress you know as i say and you know, other 80% of the work will be get done in 20% of the time in my view all this 80% work has been happening over the last few years i would say probably by 2025 you know you would see a quantum and significant adoption and and difference at the bfs and will make in the space of ai and ml okay kaspar you uh, earlier alluded to the whole uh, usage of uh, ai in uh, and intelligent platforms in you know helping the emerging markets and the, the larger population how is it helping you uh, identify new products and services tap into uh, to uh, needs that the customers themselves haven't realized uh, pro- provide products and offerings around those uh, those needs and create new revenue streams for business so echo with what mike and sarah was saying earlier so i think we as the largest and the most widespread uh, microfinance institutions in the world so we have built for the past four years um, the biggest neural network in microfinance by the name of bri brains so this acts as our central brains this enhances our risk management excellence and uh, accelerates our lots of services through apis from this bri brains provided to all of the our ap- applications within the organizations So this BRI brains basically it stores consolidates information from various data streams across the groups and uh, its partner ecosystems analyze it provide us with the scoring of four main cortex so the first one is of course the credit scoring engines and services the second part is the merchant assessments and services the third one is the uh, fraud detection services and the last one is the customer profiling services so all these four APIs utilizing cr- providing some sort of a recommendation engines fraud detection services to the tax anomalies and such and last but not least of course this is the reason why we are able to fast track from 2 weeks to 2 days to 2 minutes by using our instant credit scoring based on structured and unstructured data for the past 4 years and um, last but not least i think because our segment is very very um, micro and ultra micro in indonesia right? which is the largest in indonesia so serving this market if you're not going digital if you're not going ai i think you're going to spending a lot of money i think on uh deploying sales people but we're not stopping there we have our uh, 28000 sales people across indonesia but we are helping them augmenting them with this ai so 
Previously, um, it took about 2.5 um, trillions per month. Now it's already 4 trillions booked per month from these 28,000 people. So we're not adding we're more... We're helping them with, with more information. Right? More productive. More productive without adding more people. So we help with uh, AI. We add more recommendation engine to them. So we build the, pet, the pipeline, the sales funnels. Mm-hmm. So with this sales funnels automatically is already available in their applications by the name of BRI Spot. So the BRI Spot handles these funnels and help them to navigate day by day, go to the next customer and next customer automatically. So this kind of stuff, I think, helped us a lot. And um, by using our open API data sets, we are able also to inform um, which are our customer, next customer to our funding officers or to our relationship managers across the nationwide. Hey, this is the next customer you should acquire because this hasn't been acquired yet. This is the score level. This is the top one. You go there, you go there every day. So this is how we build the, the, the process right now within the organizations. And they're very helpful in the pandemic for the past, uh, uh, from 2020 to 2021 and earlier, I think. Back to you, Sunia. Some great initiatives there, Casper. Uh, Mike, you uh, you work closely with insurance companies, and insurance companies have a lot of legacy, both in terms of technology and the organizational culture. How does your intelligent, uh, how do your intelligent platforms integrate with this legacy? Look, I think I think there's 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 two things here that we need to define, right? I mean, there's the one thing that's the one area where you know you help the organization, the the insurance company to to uh, to transform. Um, its systems um, and transform its 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 legacy its legacy uh, backends and 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 culture and the whole thing. I've been in that role for the last five years. My previous role, you know, so I've, I was on the inside. But but I believe there there needs to be a fast track, a regressive fast track in moving into serving the next five years. And 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 and, and again to my previous comment, the key word here is access. Um, there is only like there's only you know you know less than ten percent of the world population is actually insured if we talk about insurance right and I believe one of the biggest issues with that is is just peer raw access you know the uh, the idea that that the people do not have access to to in insurance products and services easily um, and then when they do have access that is not easily understandable it's complex um, you know it's not necessarily price right you know in a, you know again things the world is working is, is moving to like a hyper local environment and you need to understand the the differences between a singapore and indonesia um on the on the ground levels and in order to you need to understand the risk profiling and then be able to price and pr- package products you know so you know w- there's a lot of focus on technology well, and, and so forth. but i but i but um but but the the, the oh, one of the issues is one of the issues that we have is that um, is is product is product is product packaging and and how to develop products and then combine these products and and with the with the with the required technologies. So on our side, what we're doing is we're building ground up and and um, and and a lot of these a lot of the the the, the, the companies are starting to do that to so say right we spent a lot of money in transformational programs. It's not moving fast enough. It's not necessarily give, giving us the, the, the result that we want. You know, why not start to look at the ecosystem play when they, where there are people in the front lines, in the, in, the, in the trenches that's built these capabilities and technologies and then working closely together. I think that, you know, that sweet spot, and I think, again, COVID has done that, where it's a triangle of the, in this case, let's say the insurer, which is the, the underwriter, it's the risk manager, it's you know it's 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 where, where it's it's highly regulated and it understands how to operate you know portfolios of products and so forth. But then you have the the um, the, um, the 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 insurtech uh, or, or the or the new type of technology platform out, out there that is that is cloud hosted that is scalable that that can gobble up all sorts of third party technologies you know payment technologies and so forth um, omni channel or multi 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 channel type of capabilities that and then. Um, and they have access or direct access to the customer that can product packaging with a product innovation piece and work closely together. And then thirdly, in the, as part of the strangle, you have the, the telco um, or the, the large institution like, like the bank that's been, uh, that has a vast access 
to, to these customers. So the moment that triangle starts to work together, I think that is the sweet spot where you'll see real innovation. And, and let's be clear here, all of this work that we're trying to do is to achieve access and convenience to the customer, wherever they are and whatever mechanism they, they, they use on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's a mobile phone or it's a social channel or it's a chat service, our responsibility is to come together in, in this triangle between the large institution, the, 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 the new sort of insure tech or, or, or fintech uh, technology provider and the, the actual, uh, you know, in this case, some, sometimes the telco and, 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 and governments and to come together and work together to provide access, especially in insurance. If you are able to, to create that access in a simple way and form it, priced in the, in, the, in the right way, you have the opportunity to change economies at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, for me, that is the most important thing. This is why I personally am in the world of insurance, is I believe that insurance and banking plays a massive role in changing the future of the newer and younger generation, if they have access to a product where that can, that can put them into position where they do not go into the constraints of poverty, um, they have access to money for education, they have access you know, um, to money if in a case of a, if a situation of a risk or a, or a weather or, or, or the disaster because of weather patterns and stuff like that, and you have it all over, especially Asia Pacific, you can change the future, literally. And and the only thing that will put that stands between between us is is raw access. So if we can figure out and problem solve around that access and come together, I think we can do an amazing job over the next five to ten years. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll have to uh, move to a quick wrap up. Uh, you know, I would like to touch upon this last aspect on security, which is very important when it comes to a discussion around AI. One of the key challenges confronting the FSI sector is uh, ensuring the security of their business assets as well as their customer data. And uh, given the velocity and variance of recent attacks that we've seen, uh, it has really tested the trust within the VFSI environment. So how can VFSI companies ensure that their intelligent platforms become performant without sacrificing security? How can they become more risk adaptive? Quick closing comments from each of you. Maybe, uh, no further points on this. Yeah, I think let me go first, uh, Sneha. Yes, it, it's a massive uh, topic. Um, like every bank, uh, we uh, you know, security of paramount importance. I think my, my only reflection I've seen over the decade the, the security, uh, whether it is an intelligent platform or a manual process, it just cannot be restricted to the relevant function who is dealing with it. It is a bank-wide responsibility. It's every a single, it's every not a, single staff in the bank must take the ownership of mm -hmm. securing the data, whether somebody is writing an email with customer information or somebody is performing a fraud detection. So, you know, I think my view is that it is a bank-wide responsibility, not only the people who are directly on the front line dealing with that. Great. Casper? Yeah, I think it's easy. Um, what's easy for a human is difficult for technology. What's in the other side, I think, what's easy for technology is difficult for a human, right? And especially right now, one of the biggest threats is the cybersecurity. And... Um, it's so fancy when we're talking about digitalizations and um, transformations on digitals, but some of the, some of the companies, some of the, especially the largest company, they forgot to, you know, securing the perimeters, I think, especially on the cybersecurity factor. So I, I concur and also echo with Sarah and Mike, I think the cybersecurity must be on the pinnacles of our digitalizations. Back to you. Mike? Mike? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a massive process, right? I mean, it's not not an easy, not an easy thing to to be able to manage the, the the emerging risks. I think the the risks are always way ahead than what we that are, what, what our systems can can do and achieve to 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 counter that. And so, in the in between, you know, cyber security, uh, sorry, so, you know, ensuring against against cyber is, is one of the first things one one needs to do because it will happen. It's inevitable. You will have a cyber attack at some point in your lifetime. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, but then I think also. Um, moving into into sort of you know moving your your oldest sort of legacy technology as quickly as you can into sort of cloud based environments where you can achieve security at scale. And within a legacy environment, you cannot do that. When, when, with on premise type of scenarios, you can't do that. 
you cannot scale um, any any systems, including your cyber or your risk threat that you have. So uh, it, as much as we need to do, do drive policies and, and you know, have insurance against cyber attacks and whatever else, and that is sort of almost like a reactive state, the proactive way to do to, to way to achieve, you know, to close that bit gap is to move um, legacy to, to, to the newer type of environments as quickly as you can. And, and in some cases, that needs very, very aggressive decision making. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, we, we, it depends on where you sit in the organization, but that needs rapid, rapid and aggressive transformation. Right. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, gentlemen. In the time that we had, we tried to delve into a lot of topics, right? Right from embarking on an AI project to the pitfalls that should be avoided, the use cases that are ripe and mature enough uh, for AI adoption, uh, some of the grassroots uh, initiatives that can be undertaken with the help of intelligent platforms that can bring in financial inclusion and, uh, you know, things like multi-commerce that uh, Mike spoke about. Uh, we also spoke about how insurance companies can uh, equip themselves and gear up for this whole wave of uh, intelligent platforms. And we also touched upon security. Thank you all, gentlemen, for your insights and perspectives. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Mike. Casper. Cheers. Thanks, Casper. Thank Thanks, Sarah. home workforce as a standard norm. With an active work from home culture, the security parameters built around infrastructure, network and endpoints to keep corporate data safe has dissolved. In this panel discussion, our experts will discuss and deliberate on cyber security in the borderless digital enterprise. I would like to invite Yashwin Singh, Executive Editor ETCIO, Economic Times to moderate the panel discussion. Over to you Yashwin. Hello viewers, welcome to this final panel discussion of the Economic Times Future Next Conclave. Traditionally, cybersecurity strategies consider protocols and architectures around the security perimeter principle. This allowed maintaining and keeping data assets in a non-accessible perimeter to the outside world. With the current pandemic leading to a significant change in working habits, including employees working from home, from quarantine hotels and other areas, the concept of security perimeter is dying. Thus, security requires a different and smarter approach. And what is this different and smarter approach? Let's hear it from our esteemed panelists who are also top enterprise cybersecurity leaders in this topical panel on cybersecurity in the borderless digital enterprise. Please join me in welcoming our panelists in alphabetical order. Ms. Chat Chawat, Asa Warak, Wong, CISO, Cassicon Bank and Cassicon Business Technology Group. Mr. Ken So, CIO BH Global. Ms. Magda Chelly, Head of Cyber Risk Consulting, Marsh, Mr. Stephen Smith, Sim, President, Isaka Singapore Chapter, and Ms. Sunila Shivpuri, CSO, Deutsche Bank. Welcome, panelists. Uh, it's ladies first, so let me kickstart the session with uh, Magda and Sunila. Uh, Magda, let me come to you first. Uh, with data and applications moving beyond the traditional enterprise into the cloud, people are an enterprise's perimeter. What are the implications of this change for a CISO and an enterprise. Your thoughts on this? First of all, good afternoon. Uh, I'm really excited and happy to be on this panel. And this topic is extremely important, especially following the current pandemic, which impacted, of course, all companies across the whole world, no matter of the size or the industry. Now, whenever there is a major change requiring as well the adoption of technology, this definitely raises additional emerging risk. And when we are discussing the previous traditional way of how companies approach cybersecurity, they were always focusing on a perimeter-based controls. Now, with employees working from home, working from everywhere, quarantine hotels from their own homes, we are unable to continue the same traditional approach 
we need to adapt and therefore consider a way to address this new emerging risks and threats coming from the fact that everyone is working from everywhere. And it's a very important and challenging change for chief information security officers in particular, as this change came very quickly. It didn't actually have the, or to take the time to plan ahead for, for example, three, five years. It happened in a matter of weeks and required companies to adapt to this change very quickly. So I would say as a conclusion to leave, of course, the time for the other panelists is that definitely the traditional approach needed a very quick adaptation to the new environment, taking consideration people and data being outside of the previously considered perimeter. Sure. Thank you so much for those inputs, uh, Magda. Uh, coming to Sunila. Uh, Sunila, clearly, uh, presumably, secure internal infrastructure simply does not apply to the current environment. You know, the divide between homes and corporates don't exist anymore. Employees are located off-site and more often than not use varied devices while at work. So this becomes pretty risky uh, from a bank's perspective. Uh, so coming uh, you know, from a bank uh, as a CISO, your thoughts on how this landscape has changed and what are the implications for a CISO here? The, the, the way, Yash, for your previous the question that you asked there, I would look at it from two perspectives, right? So one is what Megda talked about, that's the work from home, which almost happened overnight for certain organizations. In some other organization, global organizations, there was al already a practice of doing some work from home. Hence, there was a level of, and there is a level of maturity that is there, right? Because you have secure connectivity, you VPN into the organization, and then from there, you, you know, you do your day stuff. So I won't go into that that perspective, but alongside this, in, in, in during this pandemic, the other thing that got uh, expedited was to move on to the cloud. Yeah, so that became a huge thing because you are uh, parameters for security have suddenly now enlarged, and they've enlarged to an extent on one side with the work from home, on the other side with our cloud partners. Yeah, and, and this is where the whole dimension or the, you know, the way we look at security has totally gone, you know, out of uh, the traditional boxes that we were talking about in the past. So the one thing that I would always, always, always stress is that the cloud provider will provide us with secured cloud, but we have to, as, a, as CISOs, and we have to ensure that our environment on the cloud is secured. So there is a differentiation between that. Yeah. So there is not a golden uh, spoon or magical spoon that you just the moment you move on to the cloud, all your problems are solved. It's not going to get solved. It is only going to get it's easier on one side, but it gets more complex on the other side. So we as an organization need to understand and appreciate that thing. So the combination of work from home on one side and the cloud uh, you know, coming on the other side has totally expanded the, the parameters of our security piece. Yeah? Sure. And, and for us, the biggest challenge stays in how we can consistently control this entire environment, uh, which is relatively new. Absolutely. Uh, great, ma'am. Definitely, you know, well said that you can't leave everything to your cloud service provider and security, definitely not. Great. Moving on to uh, Mr. Chat Chawad, sir. Uh, you know, CISOs have always said they have sleepless nights. I'm wondering what would they say now? <laughs> yeah, I, I think like the post-pandemic right, situation, like everyone says that's now, right, that in, increased the higher risk exposure to the banks or any companies, right? Because like um, we allow the users to remote working, right? A lot. I'm sure that like all the bank previously, we don't allow remote working a lot, right? Only specific functions or um, some functions that we would allow and we have the um, uh, comp comprehensive controls over that. But now after pandemic, we, we need to allow like the users um, to remotely work from anywhere. Like that is really critical for the banks as well, because we need to ensure that the data 
even uh, it is on the uh, laptop that we provide to the uh, to the to the employees will be I mean protect hundred percent or not or even the data that we try to use on cloud right we have to put on cloud so that our employee or our staff can work um, flexibility work at home or any other places that they can work. So I think the most important thing now here is we need to understand where is the data is, sure. right? And where is the mechanism, like uh, the control that we have in the cloud Absolutely. We to understand that. Otherwise, we cannot control or um, um, uh, make sure that we are at risk in any places, right? Sure. So that is the thing that um, we need to identify first where is our data and where is our control that we have right now. Right. So basically, we need to make unknown to be known. Right. Sure. So that we can have the control over that risk. Right. Sure. And another one is, um, I think that is the critical one as well is about the uh, BYOD, being your own devices. Right. During the pandemic uh, situation, most of the staff would request that, hey, I would like to work from home. So can we use like the personal devices to access to our systems? Right. That is very critical decision because uh, the business is still need to going on, right? And um, definitely we cannot like uh, set up the thousand or ten thousand PCs um, um, like at in one day or two days for staff to work anywhere. So that is very challenges that uh, we 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 need to address that properly, right? But I think my my opinion uh, for the BYOD. Uh, some kind like the mobile devices or tablet. If we have like um, MDM or MAM, mobile application management or mobile device management things, I think that would be able to uh, mitigate the risks. But in terms of BYOD, such as like the personal computer or notebook, that I think that is really um, too risky for, for the staff, especially for the staff who work on the critical or sensitive data, right? that uh, have the customer data, if they can uh, work on the personal PC, even we have the VDI virtual de desktop infrastructure, I don't think that we are comfortable right now. So uh, in summary, I think the um, now, the, the thing is we have higher risk exposure to, to the internet, right? So, sure. so I think we need to understand where is our asset and where is our control so we can put the control uh, properly. Yeah, sure. to protect our sure. data. Yep. Sure. So, so, I, so I was smiling because I I don't agree with your views. Yeah, that yeah. it gets more. I mean, there is a level of risk, but it does not get so risky that you, we don't allow our people to do the BYOD. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because they are, and I'm sure you will. You you're familiar with that. I mean, we can we can standardize the interface in which they come in, into the organization. We can put mm -hmm. checks and balances on our boundaries in the organization to ensure that, you know, there is nothing uh, coming in from their BYOD, you know, or there's no penetration coming in from there. So we, there are te obviously, you know, technologies that can be rolled out. But I think as organizations, we will have to move towards that direction. In that right. direction, there is no optionality available, Absolutely. right? Because the more, even if you give them a personal, you know, a laptop, the person will be operating from, you know, any location. And how do you make sure he is operating from that, that laptop? Uh, personally, myself, right. I operate out of many devices, right? So, yeah. As Absolutely. organizations, we'll have to learn to get there. Absolutely. So divergent views here from two senior technology leaders. Great. Moving on to Ken now. Ken, you know, I recently uh, met a CISO and I heard something very interesting that he said. He said, you know, my data has left the data center and my employees have left the network. So that's a very peculiar situ situation for a CISO to manage. Uh, how do you see the landscape changing uh, for a CISO? Please unmute yourself. Uh, Ken, please unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Yes. Uh, yeah. First and foremost, thanks for having me. Yeah, I think the topics of BYOD is always uh, there, and your mention of the data is is there as well. I mean, there, there, there's always joke that uh, we should 
do uh, baseline baselining and as per Sonida's mentioned, uh, create a managed environment so that it is not bring your own disasters, right? Well, but uh, I we tend to see this entire thing a little bit differently. Um, why I say that is because every time when we talk about security, we can't run away from the classic three dimension view of people process technology, right? So uh, from the traditional on prem, now in the cloud. Um, you, you have all sorts of new uh, way to train the people to have new processes. Uh, but let's say this, this is a very broad topic. Uh, today, if we let's say look at just the technology front, uh, we are not short of new proposition coming out, the likes of CASB, uh, SASE. Now we have UEBA, we have PAM, we have SENSE, so many things. Um, but to us, we see it very differently because uh, all these are good, but these are very baseline. They are looking at the context and the conduit of the whole system. But I think there is something very important that we feel is missing out from a lot of proposition uh, is exactly your question, application and data, right? So we look at data first. Now, data, we have to look at the source, not the effect, right? So where is the source of the data? So today you look at maybe 99% of the cybersecurity protection tool. They are all detection too, all right? Whether it's AV, multi-AV, sandboxing, um, machine learning, CTI, all the very flowery phases, they are using the best technology to detect the bad guy so that they can remove the bad guy. However, I think there's one very serious uh, gap that everybody has been uh, ignoring is in the first place, we cannot detect them. Right. So if you Google, you'll see this guy say, I detect better than the other guy. The other guy say, but if you, even if you can detect it today, you cannot detect it tomorrow. So we need something beyond detection. I'm, I'm not saying detection is no good, but, um, imagine, let's say you talk about work from home, right? You don't have the usual enterprise uh, level of protection. So you use your home router and all, all of us know that the internet is full of all the reptiles and parasites and all this coming to the notebook. And the best thing is that the endpoint protection are detection tools. So we, the moment we cannot detect them and we encrypt the viruses via the VPN into the enterprise. And that concept fundamentally is wrong. Is wrong. So we need something non-detection like sanitization and things that is able to sanitize data before it's encrypted. So when I mention encrypted, I'm actually referring to encryption uh, on the move uh, in transit or at rest, right? So both both are the same. We feel that the moment we have encryption, uh, we make we need to make sure that the encryption is protecting privacy, not protecting viruses, right? So the sanitization therefore come in very well in the data aspect. So the application aspect is even more interesting. See, today we have a lot of uh, application review tool, you know, the SAS tool and that's two and also the two. If we look at the SAS tool for source, uh, source code, so we um, scan the source code to a hard content uh, to the perfection, and then later on we deploy the binary. Right. <laughs> so no, sure. and we need to remember that the compiler is not perfect. Compiler is another application. So we scan the source code and then go to the compiler, and we don't know what animal is the binary, and then we deploy the bin binary and um, we, we can cite example like Essilon and Singtel and things. Uh, we need a binary test. There are technologies that is able to do that. It can reverse engineer the binary and do white box scanning of the test. And we advocate both. Of we feel that uh, the technology front, uh, a lot of common gaps are missing and we should address the source, not the effect. Just like phishing, right? I mean, a lot of people buy anti-phishing, but when you receive a phishing mail that say my uncle died yesterday and I have three million dollars to transfer your to your account, I think that is a primary one standard. Everybody knows how to delete the email. But today, if you receive an email, contextually is so real. I think really we need to do a network scan because they are already in our shop. So we have to weigh between the focus of the cost and effect. Yeah. Absolutely. Whether it's on cloud or on prem, right. the same principle will apply. In my sure. View. Sure, Ken. Great. Uh, let me come to Stephen now. Uh, Stephen, in such a scenario of a perimeterless world, 
how can organizations secure their assets when hybrid applications span in-house and cloud provider environments? Okay, first of all, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I think we can look at it um, across the um, entire NIST framework of uh, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And uh, there are three key areas which I feel that um, uh, folks should focus on when you look at uh, uh, applications that span uh, in-house and uh, cloud provider environments. Those three key areas to focus security efforts on uh, namely, um, zero trust, active defense, and uh, collective intelligence. I mean, um, the earlier panelists have already alluded to um, the use of MDM as so well. So zero trust essentially entails verifying the endpoint, uh, which can come from anywhere. Um, and then um, you have active defense, which entails a combination of threat intelligence and hunting, as well as automated uh, response. Because uh, personally, I believe in the uh, that ditch that um, it's not a matter of if but when uh, you'll be breached and uh, there's no silver bullets in security every solution out there which says that they are 100 percent they provide 100 percent security uh, I, I am I'm very uh, doubtful about that and um, thirdly is on collective intelligence which is really about um, having a community it's about uh, crowdsourcing information getting involved with cybersecurity associations, um, share and learn and get the pulse of the industry so that you can um, detect threats early and uh, be able to take the necessary actions, learn from each other. So while this, all these three areas, uh, these three perspectives and uh, in, uh, solutions can, can be established on-premise for cloud solutions, uh, many of these are, are ingrained into um, what um, Ken has alluded to earlier, the SASE, the Secure Edge, the Secure Access, Secure Edge, where functions of the network and security point solutions are converged into unified, unified uh, services. I think more importantly, the, the convergence of um, on-premise and uh, cloud would mean that processes need to be streamlined and integrated. I mean, this ranges from, um, earlier on mentioned about this framework, this ranges from uh, asset management, architecture reviews to uh, SIEM monitoring to incident response and so forth. So yeah, let's take uh, architecture reviews, uh, detection uh, and monitoring as well as uh, incident response as, as three examples. Sure. So architecture reviews need to include the assessment of integration uh, between the on-premise and cloud solutions. A lot of times people focus on is the on-premise system um, uh, reviewed it's okay, it's fine. If the cloud solution review is okay, it's fine. But what about the integration between both of them? How the API calls are protected in a zero trust approach? This is beyond simply um, assessing the on-prem and the cloud environments as independent setups. In fact, regardless of whether it is SAS, PaaS, or IAS, uh, I always go to the whole nine yards with our vendors, expecting them to assure us of their um, security posture. And, and of course, beyond the usual audit, pen testing, and SOC 2 reports, I would also utilize um, third-party posturing tools to give an assessment. Um, for detection and monitoring, the um, question is, um, is there adequate uh, logging and monitoring for such integration calls as well, and ensuring that you're able to uh, obtain adequate intelligence when your cloud provider gets breached to take timely action, such as triggering your uh, incident response uh, playbook. And finally, for incident response, uh, is it built into your contractual terms and conditions on uh, breach notification requirements, including reporting timelines, uh, to timely and adequately appraise the customer of breaches? I mean, tabletops and incident drills should also involve the simulation of uh, cloud-based breaches as far as possible. Sure. Great. Thanks a ton uh, for that very comprehensive answer, uh, Stephen. Uh, let me come back to Magda now. Magda, do you echo Stephen's sentiments there? He talked about a lot of technologies, SAS, zero trust. Uh, what else should CISOs do or uh, adopt uh, when it comes to securing multi-cloud environments? I would say we had a very interesting overview for everyone here about different technological solutions. But I will take a step back. And I think what is really important to understand with this, this complex environment is that we have a lot of tools and controls that we can implement. However, as a security professional in charge of the cybersecurity strategy, for example, for a company, 
It all comes down to our risk appetite and what we really need to protect and how much we are happy to lose or what is the risk that we're happy to take. So when we know what is really important for us in terms of data, we can decide as well on how to implement the right controls across what Stephen said, basically using the NIST framework, identify, protect, detect, recover, and respond and recover, right? However, again, the tools are there. We have several choices. We have definitely an immense number of vendors that are coming to us and marketing to us certain tools doing every time something more. Now, again, the question is, what do we need as a company? Every enterprise or business will have different cyber exposures and different risk appetite. Now, this is very important to start and build a strategy that goes following that and understand as well what exactly investment and what controls we would need to address the main emerging cyber risks that are I would say worst case scenarios for us as a business. We cannot secure everything, that's impossible. 100% security doesn't exist and is not the right goal and nor either something that you can achieve as a company. However, what we can do as security professionals is to mitigate that risk, mitigate the impact of any cyber attack that might happen and consider again, those worst case scenarios that might impact heavily our business from a financial perspective, especially. Now, just to end on this part as well, if we're talking about choices of tools and how much we need to invest in a, the right tool, again, it's all about understanding the impact or consequences on those specific cyber scenarios that are very important for our business. When we have that visibility, and understand the consequences of those cyber loss scenarios, we are eventually able as well to quantify those financial losses and consider what kind of controls we need to implement. And if those controls are actually cost effective for our business. And again, we, we talked at the beginning, you know, it's all about companies. We're doing business and we're trying to protect the business. So, Implementing controls without aligning with the business goals and without aligning with our cap financial capabilities and budget will actually lead to perhaps not the right investment, perhaps not investing in the right risk or mitigative controls that we need to implement. And again, always thinking and considering the fact that 100% security is never achievable. So how do you manage appropriately that risk for your company in alignment again of your business risk and in alignment with your budget limitations. Sure, sure, Magda. Uh, yeah. So Sunila, like Magda referred to, you know, how much should somebody invest in security solutions? Uh, security infrastructure is often associated with high costs and complexity. How can CISOs reduce complexity by deploying fewer products with richer capabilities and lower costs? while still maintaining a high security stance. I mean, that's a yes, pretty really challenging have, task. You have, uh, you have uh, hit the thing spot on, right? So the continuous challenge that we have is, on one side, we say we can never be 100% secure. On the other side, the costs are high, right? So this is, a, this is a, something that we have to deal with on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I just want to take a little bit of time, a couple of minutes to just give you a context. So when we started on this journey six, seven, eight years back, right? Um, it was like a kid in a toy shop, right? So you you said, oh, I'm the latest cybersecurity professional. I want to secure, I want to buy this tool, I want to buy that tool. And I we kept on buying, yeah, because the products kept on evolving and every time there was a new feature that was there, which was not, which was lacking on the other one. So we went and bought that. And now we have the entire, uh, you know, buffet of products lying there. So the first thing, first thing we have to do is to get rid of that, right? We have to build the security architecture. We must know, you know, and we must work on the security architecture that is required for the organization. The basic frameworks are available. You can take that, you can tune it to your organization, so on and so forth. 
So you have to do that. And then you have to start removing the duplications that is there in the environment. So all that is pretty technical stuff, but that has to be done. But I think even after that, when you go back and say, I'm sorry, you know, we are not 100% secured and the cost is what it is. I think we have to now start to look at, and I mean, I, I, I would call it threat-based security. Uh, so I must start to look at it from that perspective. Yeah, I can't secure myself against everything. And coming back to uh, Hector's point before, I must understand my risk profile, right? And what I'm, I'm able to accept within the organization. But having said that, go for th threat base. I must know who uh, I'm fighting against. So who are the threat actors that are coming for my organization? What is their modus operandi? What are the techniques that they use? What are the tools that they use? And try and build up something against that so we can secure ourselves against that, right? Of course, there would be a new threat actor that comes in and, and you know, you will find him inside the organization. Deal with it, yeah? They have to do the basic stuff that you always do from detection and, and all of that. You have to do that. But start to focus now on what it is. And I'm just, the only thing is, I hope you identify your threat actors right, yeah? I hope you identify what your threats are right so that you can then focus on that rather than build generic solutions uh, and infrastructure across the, the firm. Sure, sure. Uh, Magda, you, want, you had a point there? You wanted to add to what Shinyala just said? Yeah, absolutely. I would like just to add on the perspective of, you know, how we describe cyber risk since many, many years. And companies used traditionally the qualitative approach to cyber risk mentioning that, for example, the company is exposed to high, medium, or low cyber risk. This is subjective, and it's not aligned with the business goals or, or objectives, because at the end, it doesn't show to the business stakeholders how much they might eventually lose if something happens. I had situations where companies mentioned that oh, there is no privacy law in the country, therefore they are okay if there is a data breach. And this is, of course, a little bit controversial, but it does happen. However, when a company is able to understand what exactly happens following, for example, a data breach, using a quantitative framework, which defines very clearly all the consequences and impacts, then the company understands the financial losses. Whenever a company, for example, is a victim of a cyber attack like ransomware, which is becoming very popular, we are not only talking about business interruption, for example. We are talking about loss of market share. We are talking about loss of reputation, which can be as well described in a quantitative way. And all comes down to understanding the costs implied or the cost following a cyber attack that materialized. Now, how that very clearly impacts the investment again is that if you understand the financial losses following the cyber attack, you're able to choose the right way to invest in the controls and you don't have any more this, I would say, attitude or perception that, oh, this is even if it happens, it won't affect, affect financially my company. I will still continue to be able to, you know, provide business to my clients. So I think as a conclusive point here, when we talk about investment in cybersecurity, moving out from qualitative frameworks to quantitative frameworks to define very clearly cyber risk is very helpful and can definitely guide chief information security officers into a right decision-making process rather than based on subjective sure. metrics or just qualitative approach. Sure. Wonderful inputs, Magda. Let me come back to Mr. Chachawat now. Uh, Chachawat, the human behavior is now the front line of defense. What's the best approach for CISOs to mitigate issues related to humans uh, on their networks? Because, you know, experts estimate that between 70 to 80 percent of the cost attributed to cyber attacks is actually a result of human error. So yeah. we can't actually uh, underlook that uh, fact. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we, we need to accept that the human is the always the weakest ring, right? That because we have like the emotion, we have um, the need, 
right? So we are in 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 like um uh, at the um uh, the victim easily, right? So for the technology that everyone just said like now that we can buy or we can invest whatever that we need right, based on our um uh, risk that we have. So we can utilize our like uh, technology or process to to address the risks. But anyway, the um, human or the employee will be always the wicked risk. So uh, previously we talked about to build the security awareness for staff, right? But you know, I think this time uh, the awareness is not enough. So we need to build a culture. Right, I think uh, for the in uh, uh, the organization, we need to have some kind like um, the cyber hygiene cultures, right? So we need to identify what kind of behaviors that we require all the staff to demonstrate, right? To help reduce the risks, right? So we don't need to have like uh, many behaviors that we we identify. Maybe we can have only four or five behaviors that um, if our staff uh, follows right. We can also reduce the significant risk already, such as like how do we secure our password, right? How we secure our email, right? So that we will not um will be the uh, the victim of the phishing, right? So how we will secure our data, and how we will secure our devices, right? And the last one is very important as well is if our staff. Uh, file any suspicious issue, so we need to know that who will be the one who can report to, right? We need to have that um a contact number or contact person so that our staff will okay if they have any suspicious thing that might relate to cyber security issues, so they can contact and get help from them, right? So I think the first one need to identify the required behavior and build the cyber culture in the organization, not only like security awareness that uh, have e-learning, right? So everyone can go to the e-learning and, you know, I think, I believe that everyone can pass the e-learning easily, but after pass the e-learning, so what was next, right? Then you will, they will never like follow the things that they just learned in the e-learning. Right? Another thing is, uh, after we have identified the uh, required behaviors to build the culture, right? So I think we will need to um, test as well, right? Like cyber drill. So th let's say like for the fitting email, right? So we can send the email or whatever things that can build the awareness to the customer. But the real things is very important. We should have like um, sending the fitting email to our staff to test whether they really understand and not, can notice whether that is the real email or phishing email. So we need to do that like on a regular basis right, to address um, the, the things that are the human normally be the victim. This sure. kind of thing I think that we, we yeah. should build on the culture. Yeah. Okay. Great, so culture is of paramount importance. Right. Uh, great. Uh, Ken, you know, I was recently uh, going through a report. That report was actually from the UK. And it showed that half of UK workers allowed friends and family members to access their work devices with no restrictions at all. I'm sure the stats wouldn't be different in other countries as well, including India, Singapore, and probably, you know, Malaysia, Thailand. How do we take care of uh, the human behavior? Uh, you're on mute, Ken. Okay. Uh, that actually reminds me of a very common and interesting quote that I heard. Uh, is that hackers don't break in, they simply lock in, right? So do we really know, are they in our shop? I think then that will relate uh, very closely to two areas, which is the focus and also the visibility, which uh, Sunila and Magna actually mentioned. I, I, I heard that. And of course, we have 24 hours a day, how, how to do so many things, right? Operationally speaking, of course, there's no 100% assurance and how to cover all ground. So that comes to the balance of 80-20, right? So, but then this is what we know, but how to do it? Uh, I find certain approaches that we use uh, very useful. Uh, how, uh, basically, if you, for example, you do a shodan, right? You do a shodan check. Uh, recently, I, I just uh, uh, got from my, my staff that 
I think the latest is last week, about 9,000 uh, exposed points are still having eternal blue exposure. So these companies are not patching it at all. They, they Either they don't understand or they just ignore it. Yeah. So coming back to your question, uh, it is a kind of uh, culture like what uh, Wat mentioned just now. How to instill the culture, uh, no matter how many training you are, right? you tell them not to click, they double click in this sort of thing. Uh, as an IT department, we understand that and it's very close to our heart. Whenever an incident happens, the entire morning is gone, right? Or maybe a few days is gone. So we find um, the leak credential search is very useful because the moment we have the leak credential search, we can focus very well on why, what, when is uh, we, we have to take care. So it gives us the focus. And then once we have that, culture people that you know you don't do this sort of thing use corporate pc for all sorts of uh, play games and whatever um there's another area that we find very useful is uh, automated vapt yeah because uh if you deploy a battalion of people to test uh, 2000 nodes in your enterprise it's going to be very costly and also the ironical thing today is that if you do a vapt the moment the report is generated it's already outdated so if you are using a robotic way, you can repeatedly test it every week, for example. You get the latest uh, report and your security posture. I think there are a lot of uh, possibilities that we can explore collectively. But of course, in the interest of time, uh, yeah. I share with you some of the approaches that we find very useful here. Great. Great. Then we discuss can... more. Yeah. yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yes, I would just like to add sure. on to this. Yeah. I mean, I... I, I heard the statistics you said, but I mean, when you're talking about, if you're talking about family and friends using corporate devices given to the individuals, uh, I think that is a different, uh, you know, discussion point because then the organizations have to deal with those individuals. But if you are talking about, you know, BYOD, uh, you know, devices and that being used or shared among their family and friends, I think that is a legitimate, uh, you know, uh, requirement from those individuals, right? And we then as an organization have to build the balance, checks and balances to ensure that it is still a safe access and we still know what's happening there. Yeah, so I think we just need to differentiate the two. Absolutely, ma'am. Great point there. Uh, so, Stephen uh, can refer to automation, right? So, what do you think? What role can behavioral analysis and proactively automating policies have on preventing data loss? You know, one advantage of automation definitely is it helps to overcome the you know great shortage that we are seeing in the cybersecurity space. What else do you think would uh, this help? Um, first of all, I would like to um, sort of. Um address an earlier point to add more details about it with regards to uh, um, why frameworks are so important. I mean, the NIST framework, I shared a fair bit about it, uh, I think whether it's COVID or NIST, um, it is important regardless of um, what kind of normal we are looking at right now. It may be a new cybersecurity normal, but the frameworks are still very fundamental. Why is that so? Because um, we talked about risk governance, we talked about uh, um, optimizing risk and so forth. And these are all implicit in the framework itself. In the identified pillar itself, we talk about identifying threats, which is where the threat modeling comes in. And that is very important. I think it was earlier shared about uh, we need to address specific threats by threat modeling, the business impact assessment, uh, talking about uh, the risk quantification, whether it's using fair model and so forth. So that part of the the uh, framework itself uh, is where all the governance risk uh, comes into play. Um, and, and with regards to um, behavioral analysis and proactively automating policies, uh, I think um, if you have consistent and good baseline trade, the behavioral analysis, whether it's at the network or the endpoint level, can go a long way into detecting uh, sophisticated attacks and data breaches. For instance, um, a large amount of data exfiltrating the network at irregular hours should sound alarm bells, right? So automating an alarm block may help mitigate that uh, data loss. However, again, there's no silver bullet. Automating policies is really an art rather than a science. Most uh, behavioral systems are based on confidence scoring uh, uh, algorithms. 
So we ask ourselves, what confidence score should we decide on automating a containment? Sure. Is it 99% or is it uh, 1%? Uh, how do you showcase your duty? Is there a risk of false positives in our bid to focus over zealously on capturing uh, false negatives? Judgment calls have to be made. While automation sounds attractive, um, it has to be traded carefully because the last we want is to self-inflict a denial of service attack against all our assets. You assume that there is a ransomware attack across all your endpoints and you start containing all of them, right? So um, if you... so. My feel is that if you can't train a solution to have a proper baseline, it may be better off um, turning on just detection-only mode and let your SOC analysts uh, deal with the alerts. There's a reason why so many of the security operations centers out there are still very heavily uh, manpower intensive because um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is not at that level where we can really automate every single thing. Sure, sure, sure. Stephen, uh, panelists, we are approaching the end of this session. So final question to all of you. I request all of you to be very crisp and concise in your responses, uh, starting with Sunila. Uh, Sunila, what are some best practices that CISOs need to adopt to secure the crown jewels in the modern cloud first post pandemic world? Well, if you know what your crown jewels are, uh, then it would get easier. So for big organizations, that itself becomes a problem, right? Uh, and there's always a debate on, I'm just putting a bank in context. Is it payment systems, your crown jewels, or it's your active directory's crown jewel, right? So that's a debate by itself. But uh, if uh, one, one very uh, critical uh, thing from my side is put them in a separate network segment, yeah, so that you can then have all your zero trust. I mean, we talked about those things implemented more thoroughly on that on those uh, you know crown jewels sure. uh, so that's in a very you know nutshell i can say that identify your jewels and then put them in a separate more secure segment sure yeah. great mr chachawat yes i think i have uh three points to highlight here right the first one right same as sunila said uh the first one we need to know what are our assets that is the very critical one right because we cannot protect all the assets at the same level right because we have the critical one we have the low risk one we need to identify that first right the second one um either like cloud or on-prem application or systems we will need to do the basic right right mm -hmm. so we will not need to have like really advanced technology things to implement all the times right like Let's say we have the antivirus install, we have the hardening, we have the uh, vulnerability assessment, we have patching on a regular basis. We do the basic thing, right? We know our asset, right? Okay. So I think that will uh, address 80% of the risk already, right? So other thing else, we can have like other things like advanced technology to address, right? The last one. Right. I said, um, uh, actually, Magda already said that no technology that can prevent us 100% from the cyber attack. Right. So, yeah, the detection and recovery response is very important right now. So early detection will help us to reduce the impact once we got the, uh, the attack. So, right. yeah, that's three okay. points here. Great. Uh, Magda, quickly, your thoughts. Sure. Two points for me. I'm going to make it very short. The first one, it's all about risks. We're not talking only about controls. We're talking about risk and the risk appetite of the company. So 100% security doesn't exist, and therefore we need to align with that. The second point, cyber criminals, and this is a point for everyone, not only for security professionals, even if I'm sure they know about it, cyber criminals will not go and attack your best secure systems. They, first of all, are able to evade security controls, and second, they will target your weakest link or your weakest point within your company, not your strongest point. So those are my two points. It's all about risk, and then the cyber criminals, including malicious hackers, are very well uh, aware about the security controls that companies have, and are able to evade them. So coming back to what we said, detection is key as well. Sure, great. Ken? 
Yeah, I will summarize it as in uh, seeing cybersecurity and enterprise, for example, for the CISOs, uh, uh, from the CISOs view to have a holistic uh, thing. It's not about buying a technology, buying a tool. That's the last thing we want. Uh, not about buying the most expensive and reputable tool or the cheapest one. So I still fall back to the traditional view of people process technology, right? But of course, it has to be a fitting one. Every landscape is different. And I would like to share the last bit. It's very interesting. I learned that people process technology has to be enhanced with one more thing called situation. Uh, one good example is like in today's COVID-19 situation, it's not about just people process technology. The situation has called for a new protection because there are new way of fishing. And uh, I heard about one uh, very good example from our DY CEO of our CSA recent, recently is uh who knows, right? Under this situation today, uh, out of the 11 CII, now probably we need a number 12 CIIs, which is an online gross, grocery shopping platform during COVID-19. Yeah. So think about holistic approach. That's my sure. take. Great, Ken. Uh, final thoughts, Stephen, before we wrap up the session. Yep. Um, general rule of thumb is not to go on the cloud for the sake of going on the cloud without uh, being fully aware of the risk benefit which I, uh, other panelists have already uh, muted. Um, that is very important. After all, cybersecurity is not just a business enabler, but a business differentiator. And should the posture degrade when you move to the cloud? Because you may have certain um, controls that you put in place that is tighter on the Then the risk owner has to decide, appraised by, appraised by uh, cybersecurity and risk teams, whether the benefits uh, warrant the risk delta. Nothing else, um, definitely, again, follow a uh, proper um, framework to run through the governance uh, risk processes to ensure that you don't leave any uh, stones unturned. Yeah. Sure. Great. That's all we have time for, ladies and gentlemen. To sum up the session, businesses cannot expect cybersecurity to be an easy fix. Combining software-based security with employee education and vigilance holistically across the business is essential to minimizing human risks. Taking advantage of the latest digital trends shouldn't come at the expense of your cybersecurity. With a considered and complete approach to cybersecurity, you can get the best of both worlds. With this, we bring the session to a close. Thanks panelists for those wonderful insights and thanks participants for patiently watching this session. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank Thank you. You. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. In today's world that is full of uncertainties and economic tension, corporate digital transformation is at the tipping point and business and technology leaders are being challenged to evaluate the digital transformation strategy. A simple advice would be to look down at your smartphone and ponder on all the magical things it does for you. While this pandemic is certainly not permanent, it has forced us to reconsider our working and consumption patterns which are here to stay. Corona is not just categorizing every unit and service into essentials and non-essentials, but it also challenges a lot of existing models. It continues to creatively destroy the present system, leaving one with no option but to adapt and innovate. At this point, we are not taking a subjective view and commenting whether it's good or bad. All we know is that it is finally here and is likely to stay. It would therefore bode well for business and technology leaders to reimagine their departments and prepare for a postmodern world driven by information, collaboration, and mobility. Winning organizations will put their customers at the center of design and engage them with simplicity. To cope with this change and thrive in the uncertain digital future, IT and business leaders must break free of their patterns of conventional thinking. Organizations must adapt structures and policies to embrace flexible experimentation with emerging technologies and business models. It is time you looked at creative destruction for reducing organizational walls so that companies can innovate together. The only thing that will put the brake on these cutting edge technologies becoming the core of the new economy sooner than later 
are backward-looking policies that seek to prop up an obsolete economy. New technologies and processes continuously revolutionize the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old, incessantly creating a new. The show must go on, if not in person, in virtual. With this, we would like to conclude this first edition of the Economic Times Future Next Conclave with the promise of coming back again next year with a bigger and better second edition. We hope all of you enjoyed being a part of this conclave as much as we enjoyed putting it all together. We also hope the best practices shared during the course of the day will help you in leveraging technology much better for ensuring business growth of your enterprise. I would once again like to thank all our speakers and attendees for helping us make this conclave a success. Thank you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Yashwind, for summing up this event. With this, we have come to the end of the day-long virtual conclave. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers for the valuable time and content they shared on this platform. My special thanks to all the participants for the active engagement. Finally, thanks to our supporting partner, ISACA, and event tech partner, WeConfix, for making this event big and successful. Once again, thanks to all. Stay safe.